Random House Audiobooks presents Buffett, The Making of an American Capitalist by Roger Lowenstein Read for you by James Lurie Buffett, the making of an American capitalist. Almost from the day that Dr. Pollard awakened him to the world, six pounds strong and five weeks early, Warren Buffett had a thirst for numbers. As a boy, he and his friend Bob Russell would pass an afternoon on the Russell's front porch, which overlooked a busy intersection, recording the license plate numbers of passing cars. When the sky darkened, they would go inside and spread open the Omaha World Herald, counting how often each letter appeared and filling entire scrapbooks with progressions of numbers, as though they held the key to some Euclidean riddle. Often, Russell would reach for the almanac and read out a list of cities. One by one, Warren would spit back the populations. I'd say a city, he'd hit it on the nose, Russell would recall half a century later. If I gave him ten cities, he'd hit every one. Baseball scores, horse racing odds, every numeral was fodder for that precocious memory. Combed, scrubbed, and stuffed into a pew of Dundee Presbyterian Church, Warren would pass the time on Sundays calculating the lifespans of ecclesiastical composers. He would stand in the living room with a paddle and ball, counting, counting by the hour. He would play Monopoly for what seemed forever, counting his imagined riches. Blue-eyed with a fair complexion and pink cheeks, Warren was intrigued not merely with numbers, but with money. His first possession was a nickel-coated money changer given to him by his Aunt Alice at Christmas and thereafter proudly strapped to his belt. When he was five, he set up a gum stand on his family's sidewalk and sold chiclets to passers-by. After that, he sold lemonade, not on the Buffett's quiet street, but in front of the Russell's house, where the traffic was heavier. At an age when few children knew what a business was, Warren would get rolls of ticker tape from his stockbroker father, set them on the floor, and decipher the ticker symbols from his father's standard and poor's. He would search the local golf course for used but marketable golf balls. He would go to Exarban Racetrack and scour the sawdusted floors, turning over torn and discarded stubs, and often finding a winning ticket that had been erroneously thrown away. And at dusk, as they rocked on the Russell's front porch glider in the stillness of the Midwestern twilight, the parade of Nash's and Studebaker's and the clanging of the trolley car would put a thought in Warren's mind. All of that traffic with no place to go but right by the Russell's house, he would say. If only there were a way to make some money off it. Warren was the second of three children and the only son. His mother was a petite, feisty woman from a small town in Nebraska. She had a lively temperament and, as was said of women relegated to a supporting role, a good head for numbers. Warren's father, a serious but kind man, was surely the dominant influence in his life. Opening to Warren's eyes the world of stocks and bonds, he must have planted a seed. But insofar as things are knowable, Howard Buffett's acumen for numbers was not on a par with his son's. Nor was his passion for making money. What was it, then, that prompted Warren to turn from that mannered, comfortable household to crawl along the floor of a racetrack as though it were a bed of pearl oysters? What was it that would enable him, years later, to stun his colleagues in business time and again by computing columns of figures in his head and by recalling encyclopedic volumes of data as easily as he had the population of Akron? Warren's younger sister, Roberta, said flatly, I think it was in his genes. Warren's first years were difficult ones for the family. His father, Howard, was working as a security salesman with Union Street Bank. On August 13th, 1931, two weeks shy of Warren's first birthday, his father returned from work with the news that his bank had closed. It was the defining, faith-shattering scene of the Great Depression. His job was gone. His savings were lost. But in short order... Howard announced that Buffett, Sklenica & Company had opened its doors in the Union State Bank building on Farnham Street. 
the same street where Warren would later live and work. Howard and a partner, George Sklenica, peddled investment securities, municipal, corporation, and public utilities, stocks, and bonds. Howard now drew on his courage and will, for the market crash had tarnished the public's trust. Omaha, at first, had thought itself immune to the Depression, but by 1932, wheat prices had plunged and farmers were eating in soup kitchens. Staunchly Republican Omaha voted Roosevelt in a landslide. The next year, 11,000 registered for relief. Born in those meanest of times, Buffett Sklenica appears at first to have been a business only in name, a place where Howard could hang his hat and work on commission. His first sales were long in coming, and the commissions were small. Warren's mother, Layla, managed to put dinner on the table, but she often skipped herself to give Howard a full portion. The family was so strapped that Layla stopped going to her church circle for want of 29 cents to buy a pound of coffee. And the Buffets were racked by those extremes of nature that in the Midwest seemed as if fused with the Depression itself. The Great Depression began, Layla wrote, with a terrible 112-degree heat, Dust storms blew in from Oklahoma, and Omahans vainly sealed their homes against the locusts. On the day of Warren's fourth birthday party, a high searing wind blew the paper plates and napkins off the table and buried the porch in red dust. Warren and his sister Doris would bear the suffocating heat outside, waiting for the iceman to hop from his horse-drawn cart and hand them ice slivers to suck on. Worse than the heat was the bitter winter cold, Bundled up, Warren and his sister would walk eight long blocks to the Columbian School in weather so frigid that salesmen kept their motors running as they paid their calls for fear that they wouldn't be able to restart their engines. By the time that Warren began school, his father's fortunes were rapidly improving. When Warren was six, the Buffets moved to a more spacious Tudor brick home with a sloping shingled roof. The bad times in the Buffett home were not discussed they were banished. But they seemed to have deeply affected Warren. He emerged from those first hard years with an absolute drive to become very, very rich. He thought about it before he was five years old, and from that time on, he scarcely stopped thinking of it. When Warren was six, the Buffets took a rare vacation to Lake Okoboji in northern Iowa, where they rented a cabin. Warren managed to buy a six-pack of Cokes for 25 cents then he waddled around the lake selling the sodas at five cents each for a nickel profit. Back in Omaha, he bought soda pop from his grandfather's grocery and sold it door to door on summer nights while other children played in the street. Howard Buffett was determined that Warren would never repeat his own experience of hardship. He unfailingly expressed confidence in Warren and supported him in whatever he did. But he was not excited by money. His passions were religion and politics. He was a self-consciously moral man and had the courage of his beliefs, which were conservative in the extreme. Convinced that Roosevelt was destroying the dollar, Howard gave gold coins to his children and bought pretty things for the house, a crystal chandelier, sterling silver flatware, and oriental throw rugs, all with a view that tangibles were better than dollars. He even stocked up on canned foods and purchased a farm intended to be the family's refuge from the hellfire of inflation. Howard also stressed a principle that was more enduring than any of his political opinions, namely the habit of independent thought. Howard drilled the children in religious values, but also in secular ones. He taught an adult Sunday school class, but he also served on the public school board. Scarcely a week went by without his reminding Warren and his sisters of their duty, not just to God, but to community. He was fond of telling them, You are not required to carry the whole burden, nor are you permitted to put down your share. By age ten, Warren was already as fascinated by stocks as other boys were by model aircraft. At home, he began to chart the prices of stocks on his own, observing their ups and downs, he was bewitched by the idea of deciphering their patterns. At 11, he took the plunge and bought three shares of City's Service Preferred, as well as three shares for his sister Doris, at $38 a share. 
I knew then he knew what he was doing, Doris would recall. The boy lived and breathed numbers. But city service plunged to 17. They sweated it out, and the stock recovered to 40, whereupon Warren sold, netting after commission his first five dollars of profit in the market. Directly he sold, city service climbed to 200. It was his first lesson in patience. Warren's exploits were always based on numbers, which he trusted above all else. In contrast, he did not subscribe to his family's religion. Even at a young age, he was too mathematical and too logical to make the leap of faith. He adopted his father's ethical underpinnings, but not his belief in an unseen divinity. In a person who was honest in his thoughts, and especially in a boy, such untempered logic can only lead to one terrifying fear the fear of dying, and Warren was stricken with it. Every week, no matter if the snows were four feet high, Layla and Howard insisted that Warren go to Sunday school, but it didn't sustain him. When he sat in church, calculating the lifespans of the ecclesiastics, there was a purpose to it. He wanted to know whether faith would result in living a longer life, not faith in an afterlife, as a believer would have had, but a concern for living longer in this one. He and Bob Russell would be sitting on the Russell's front porch glider in the stillness of an afternoon, and as if brought on by a sudden prairie twister, Warren would say, Russ, there's one thing that I'm scared of. I'm afraid to die. He brought it up maybe every year or so, often enough so that it stuck in Russell's mind. It seemed disconnected from everything else that Russell knew of Warren, who was usually so buoyant. Sometimes Russell would put bird seed on the floor of the milk box and trap a bird inside, and invariably Warren would beg him not to harm it. Russell would pull a string tied to the door of the milk box and let it go. But he couldn't release Warren from the fear of his own mortality. If you do what God gave you the talent to do, you can be successful and help others and die with a smile, Russell would say. Bob, I'm just scared, Warren would reply. Russell, a Roman Catholic, did not understand. He would wonder where it came from, why a guy who had so much going for him was so afraid. But there was an aspect of Warren's life at home that Russell did not know about. To outside appearances, the Buffett household was the ideal, loving, prosperous, inspired by high morals, and centered on the family. And such particulars were genuine. Layla would refer to the day she met Howard as the luckiest day of my life. She treated her husband like a king, a benevolent king, but a king nonetheless. A practical woman, Layla had ideas of her own about stocks, but she didn't mention them to Howard. Even when Layla had pounding headaches, she was careful not to bother Howard or disturb his reading. Her aim was to be a perfect wife. Warren's friends knew her as a tiny, cheerful woman with a pretty smile sweet and sociable, and all a Twitter, like the good witch of the North. But when the strain of trying to be perfect was too much for Layla, she would turn on Warren and his sisters with the wrath of God. Without warning, that good-humored woman would become furious beyond words and rage at her children with an unrelenting meanness, sometimes not letting up for hours. She scolded and degraded her children. Nothing they had done measured up. She compared, criticized, and dredged up every imaginable failing. In Layla's fury, she seemed as if driven by some horrible injustice. Nothing that Warren or his sisters had done would escape her notice. No transgression, however slight, was too small for one of her vicious rebukes. Even when they had committed no crime, her imagination supplied one. As far as Warren and his sisters knew, Layla's moods were wholly unpredictable and therefore all the more terrifying. And when one came over her, there was no escape. If they tried to break free, she would snap at them, I'm not finished! And then suddenly the tempest would be over. Then the sweet little woman would return. Once, in more recent years, one of Warren's sons, who was home from college, called Layla to say hello. She suddenly lit into him with all her fury. She called him a terrible person for not calling more often and detailed his supposedly innumerable failings of character, and went on for two entire hours. When Warren's son put down the phone, he was in tears. Warren said softly, 
Now you know how I felt every day of my life. He would bury himself in a favorite book, One Thousand Ways to Make a Thousand Dollars, an exhortation to future Rockefellers with stories such as Building a Business on Homemade Fudge. Warren was known as a bookworm and was certified in the neighborhood lore as having a photographic memory. He was tall for his age and liked to play sports, but was rather ungainly. He talked up his financial exploits, however, with a contagious passion. And when Warren talked, his friends perked up their ears. He didn't persuade the other boys to join him so much as he attracted them. A fireball, as his father said, drawing moths. He enlisted half the neighborhood to gather golf balls. Soon he had bushel baskets of golf balls in his bedroom, organized by brand and price. Bill Pritchard, a neighbor, recalled, he'd hand out a dozen golf balls, we'd sell them and he'd take his cut. Warren and Stuart Erickson even set up a golf ball stand at Elmwood Park, until, as Erickson recalled, business was so good that somebody snitched on us and the pro threw us out. In 1942, the Republicans in Nebraska's second congressional district were unable to find a candidate who would run against the party of a popular wartime president. In desperation, the GOP turned to an outspoken New Deal hater, Howard Buffett. In veying against inflation and big government, Howard was 40 years ahead of his time. But in Omaha, he was personally popular. He had little money. His expenses would amount to only $2,300, but he campaigned tenaciously. On election day, Howard typed out a concession speech and retired at 9 o'clock. The next day, he discovered he had won. He would call it one of the happiest surprises of his life. Warren realized his fate with a jolt. For the first time in his 12-plus years, he was leaving Omaha. In a family photograph taken just after the election, Warren looked decidedly uneasy, his handsome face set in a vague stare, his tightly pursed lips managing only the slightest suggestion of a smile. The Buffets had moved to a four-bedroom house in Spring Valley, an outlying section of Washington on Northwest 49th Street. Warren's new life revolved around his job as a carrier for the Washington Post. Now 13, he kept a record of his earnings and filed a tax return, and defiantly refused to let his dad pay the taxes. But aside from his paper route, Warren was profoundly unhappy. In June, at the end of that first unhappy year, Warren ran away the first real rebellion of his life. He and Roger Bell, the son of a Missouri congressman, and one other chum put out their thumbs for Hershey, Pennsylvania. Warren knew of a golf course there and thought they could stay a few days in Caddy. But for once, economics were not his motivation. He was mad all around. The boys arrived at nightfall without so much as a toothbrush and checked into a room at the community inn. In the morning, no sooner were they out the door then the police stopped them. Bell was short, while Warren and the other boy were close to six feet. From a distance, the police thought Bell much younger, perhaps a kidnap victim, and took the trio in for questioning. One may imagine Warren, just shy of 14, glibly persuading the authorities of their innocence without saying much about what they were doing. The police let them go, but their balloon was pricked. They thumbed their way home that day. It seems unlikely that Warren was of a mind to continue his rather half-hearted revolt. His spurts of acting out at school had been pretty tame. According to his sister Roberta, rebellious was a pretty strong word for him. But Howard and Layla were shocked. Though they were gentle with Warren when he returned to Washington, Howard resolved to nip his mutiny in the bud. He told Warren that he would have to improve his marks or give up his paper route. This worked on Warren's grades like a tonic. Far from relinquishing the paper route, he expanded it. He promptly procured a route with the Times-Herald, the Post's morning competitor, covering the same territory as he had with the Post. As Buffett would recall, if a subscriber canceled one paper and wanted the other, there was my shining face the next day. Soon Warren had five delivery routes and close to 500 papers to deliver each morning. Layla would arise early to make his breakfast. Warren was out the door by 5.20 to catch the bus down Massachusetts Avenue. On the rare occasion when he was ill, Layla did the route, but she didn't go near the money. 
Collections were everything to him, she wrote. You didn't dare touch the drawer where he kept his money. Every penny had to be there. In short, Warren had turned his paper routes into a business. He was earning $175 a month, what many a young man was earning as a full-time wage, and saving every dime. In 1945, when he was still only 14, he took $1,200 of his profits and invested it in 40 acres of Nebraska farmland. Marooned in a strange city, he was trying to jumpstart his career at a time when he was barely capable of shaving. He was reading every business book he could get his hands on, poring over actuarial tables, running his paper route. Donald Danley, a Wilson High School student who became a good friend, thought Warren was charting his way toward a financial target. In their senior year, Danley bought a used pinball machine for $25, and Warren and he played it by the hour. The machine often broke, and as Danley tinkered with it, Warren took note of his friend's mechanical skill. Warren had an idea. Why not put the machine in the barber shop on Wisconsin Avenue and rent it out? Warren approached the barber, who agreed to a 50-50 split. At the end of the first day, they found $14 in the machine. Within a month or so, Warren and Danley had machines in three barber shops. Prospering, they expanded to seven. Warren, living a real-life fantasy, thought of a name, the Wilson Coin-Operated Machine Company. Eventually, we were making $50 a week, he recalled. I hadn't dreamed life could be so good. By his senior year, he was planning a career not just in business, but specifically in investing. Sitting in the breakfast nook at home, at an age when other boys didn't get past the sports pages, he was already studying the stock tables, and word of his supposed expertise had followed him to school, where his teachers tried to pick his brain about the market. In a wily effort to capitalize on his renown, Warren shorted, that is, bet against shares of American Telephone and Telegraph Company, because he knew that his teachers owned it. They thought I knew about stocks, and I thought if I shorted AT&T, I would terrorize them about their retirement. Why this mild repute is an oracle? Warren hadn't had any coups in the market, yet people sensed that he knew. He had something innate, not merely a precocious store of knowledge, but an ability for casting it in logical terms. Faith didn't move him, but facts he could assemble in a smooth and sensible train. Quoting Danley, he just seemed to have tremendous insight. He would say things in a way that didn't leave any doubt that he knew what he was talking about. Warren graduated in June 1947, finishing 16th in a class of 374. Danley was tied for first. The yearbook captured him with bright, eager eyes, neatly parted hair, and a sheepish grin. The caption, likes math, a future stockbroker. Howard suggested the nearby Wharton School of Finance and Commerce at the University of Pennsylvania. Warren replied that college would be a waste. He had delivered almost 600,000 papers and in the process earned over $5,000. Money was coming in from newspapers, from Wilson Coin Op, and from a Nebraska tenant farmer. What's more, he had read at least 100 books on business. What, in short, did he have to learn? Howard gently pointed out that Warren was still two months shy of his 17th birthday. Finally, Warren capitulated. In August, Wilson Coin Op was sold for $1,200 to a returned war veteran. Warren pocketed his share and headed for Wharton. This time, though, Howard had been wrong. Despite Wharton's fine reputation, its curriculum was lacking in beef. Warren disgustedly reported that he knew more than his professors. His dissatisfaction was rooted in their mushy, overbroad approach. His professors had fancy theories, but were ignorant of the practical details of making a profit. Warren's fraternity mates were in awe of his intellect. He would read a chapter, they recalled, and recite it by rote. In class, when a graduate lecturer would parrot an answer from the text, Warren, who had memorized it, would burst out, You forgot the comma! Moreover, the way he glibly critiqued the faculty left his fellows spellbound. One of the frat brothers, Richard Kendall, said, Warren came to the conclusion that there wasn't anything Wharton could teach him. And he was right. When the brothers returned to Wharton in the fall of 1949, they were stunned to find that Warren wasn't there. 
Nobody ever heard from him again. In short, he had run away once more. His father had been defeated in 1948 and had returned with the family to Omaha, leaving Warren alone in the East. In Wharton, there had been nothing to keep him, no paper route, no pinball. He transferred to the familiar University of Nebraska at Lincoln, where his parents had met. I didn't feel I was learning that much, Warren explained. Nebraska called, Wharton repelled. In Lincoln, Buffett lived with Truman Wood, then affianced to Warren's sister Doris, in the upstairs of a Victorian house on Pepper Avenue. Buffett would come back from work in the late afternoon, read the Wall Street Journal, and go out with Wood to a greasy spoon for a dinner such as mashed potatoes, beef, and gravy. Wood, intrigued that Buffett had read the Bible three or four times and remained agnostic, could not resist trying to convert him. They had the usual debates about faith and the afterlife, but Buffett was immovable. For every argument that Wood raised, Buffett had a deadly logical response. In the winter, Buffett revived his golf ball business, this time as a serious enterprise. By July, he had sold 220 dozen golf balls and had reaped $1,200 from them. From all his ventures combined, he had saved $9,800. That trifling grub stake would be the source of every dollar that Buffett would earn. He had tracked every penny, the city's service stock, the paper route, the golf ball sales, the pinball, in squiggly, uneven handwriting. So prophetic was his ledger of later exploits that it called to the mind of one journalist the papers that Horatio Alger might have donated to the Baker Library at the Harvard Business School. Buffett had, in fact, applied to Harvard Business School. In the summer, he took a train to Chicago to meet an alumnus. Scrawny and unpolished, and merely 19, he struck his interviewer as not quite Harvard. The session was over in ten minutes. Two weeks later, he wrote to a friend, To tell you the truth, I was kind of snowed when I heard from Harvard. Presently, I'm waiting for an application blank from Columbia. They have a pretty good finance department there. At least they have a couple of hotshots in Graham and Dodd that teach common stock valuations. Buffett was being a bit too nonchalant. Benjamin Graham, in fact, was the dean of the securities profession. He and his colleague David Dodd had written the seminal textbook in the field, Security Analysis, and Buffett had read Graham's new book, The Intelligent Investor, while at Lincoln, and had found it highly captivating. Truman Wood, Buffett's housemate, said, It was almost like he had found a god. His jocular reference to Columbia's hotshots may be taken as posturing at a moment when he feared being rejected again. But in August, Buffett got some good news. He was going to New York to study with the master. Buffett had been fascinated by stocks since he had first chalked them up on the blackboard. He had traded stocks, studied the market, consulted oracles, and looked for the great epiphany, some mystical correlation in the charts, some system that would make him rich. Yet he was no further really than when he had combed the floor of the racetrack looking for discarded ticket stubs. Some stocks would place, but many more would not. Ben Graham opened the door and in a way that spoke to Buffett personally. He gave Buffett the tools to explore the market's manifold possibilities, and also an approach that fit his student's temper. Armed with Graham's techniques, Buffett could dismiss the oracles and make use of his native talents. And steeled by the example of Graham's character, Buffett would be able to work with his trademark self-reliance, with the sweetness of Emersonian independence, of which Buffett had heard from his father. Yet Graham was far more than Buffett's tutor. It was Graham who provided the first reliable map to that wondrous and often forbidding city, the stock market. He laid out a methodological basis for picking stocks, previously a pseudoscience similar to gambling. Investing without Graham would be like communism without Marx. The discipline would scarcely exist. Graham's approach, an oddity in the speculative climate of the late 1920s, was to look for companies that were so cheap as to be free of risk. In 1926, for example, he discovered that Northern Pipeline, an oil transporter, owned, in addition to its pipeline assets, a portfolio of railroad bonds worth $95 for each of its shares. Yet the stock was trading for only 65. Graham bought 2,000 shares, 
and suggested that the company sell its bonds as a means of recouping its buried portfolio value. The management, which was controlled by the Rockefellers, refused. But Graham mounted a proxy fight and was elected to the board. Northern Pipe capitulated, liquidated its bonds, and paid a $70 a share dividend. By 1929, the Benjamin Graham joint account, Graham's partnership, had two and a half million dollars of capital, and Graham was riding high. By then, of course, Wall Street was full of rich men. Speculators were driving prices to the moon. Graham, though, was careful. When the crash came, the joint account lost a tolerable 20%. In 1930, Graham, like so many, was convinced that the worst was over. He borrowed on margin and plunged into stocks. And then the bottom fell out. The singular feature of the great crash, as John Kenneth Galbraith observed, was that the worst continued to worsen. The smart money, the fellow who had waited out the panic, was wiped out with the rest. By 1932, the joint account had fallen 70%. Graham was close to ruin. His wife, a dance teacher, went back to work. Graham was ready to quit. But a relative of Jerome Newman, Graham's partner, put up $75,000 of capital that enabled the firm to survive. When security analysis appeared in 1934, its 40-year-old co-author had gone five straight years without being paid. Graham, in the introduction, frankly acknowledged that investing in common stocks seemed discredited. Gerald M. Loeb, a commentator whose popular book The Battle for Investment Survival appeared at about the same time as security analysis, held that investing for profit was impossible. Loeb stressed that the thing to watch was not the earnings of an enterprise, but the public psychology. The importance of full consideration of popular sentiment, expectations, and opinion and their effect on the price of the security cannot be overstressed. Yet how was one to gauge the public sentiment? The chief method was to follow the prices of stocks themselves, to watch the tape. If a stock declined, it should be sold, and quickly. If it advanced, it should be purchased. It was not enough to buy something cheap. One must only buy just as it starts to get dearer. If Loeb failed to grasp the paradox of millions of investors each reacting to one another, and yet all trying to stay a step ahead of the crowd, it was not lost on Graham and Dodd. For stock speculation is largely a matter of A, trying to decide what B, C, and D are likely to think, with B, C, and D trying to do the same. Security analysis offered an escape from such a trap. Graham and Dodd urged that investors pay attention not to the tape, but to the businesses beneath the stock certificates. By focusing on the earnings, assets, future prospects, and so forth, one could arrive at a notion of a company's intrinsic value that was independent of its market price. The trick was to invest when prices were far below intrinsic value and to trust in the market's tendency to correct. Graham dissected common stocks, corporate bonds, and speculative senior securities, what Michael Milken would call junk bonds, as the biologist did the frog. At first blush, then, security analysis was a textbook for a profession still in the making. But written during the madness of 1929 and its aftermath, the book was also a call to arms against the sins of speculation. In that sense, it was a total break. The Graham and Dodd investor saw a stock as a share of a business whose value over time would correspond to that of the entire enterprise. In The Intelligent Investor, published just before Buffett took Graham's class, Graham added that an investor who became unduly discouraged by a market drop and who allowed himself to be stampeded into selling at a poor price was perversely transforming his basic advantage into a basic disadvantage. Basic advantage? Most investors did not know they had one. Graham explained in a parable. Imagine that in some private business, you own a small share that cost you a thousand dollars. One of your partners, named Mr. Market, is very obliging indeed. Every day he tells you what he thinks your interest is worth, and furthermore offers either to buy you out or to sell you an additional interest on that basis. Sometimes his idea of value appears plausible. Often, on the other hand, Mr. Market lets his enthusiasm or his fears run away with him, and the value he proposes seems to you a little short of silly. The true investor was in that very spot. 
He could take advantage of the daily market quote or choose to ignore it. Mr. Market would always return with a new one. Graham had 20 students in 1950. Most were a good deal older than Buffett, and some were already working on Wall Street. But almost comically, the lecture devolved into a two-way seminar. Graham, who used the Socratic style, would pose a question, and even before he had the words out of his mouth, the 20-year-old from Omaha would shoot his hand skyward. In essence, Graham taught him how to get from a company's published material to a fair value for its securities. But he didn't do it merely in a theoretical way. Graham lectured about live stocks. He was quite indifferent to the fact that students were profiting from his ideas. These smart Wall Street guys, one of his students recalled, they'd all go out and make a lot of money off Ben, and he didn't seem to mind. Marshall Weinberg, Buffett's contemporary and later his broker and friend, took Graham's course twice. He recalled, he was giving you ideas. Youngstown Sheet and Tube I bought at 34 and 5 eighths and sold between 75 and 80. I bought GM on his recommendation. Also easy washing machine. The class paid for my degree. Buffett was fanatical about following in Graham's footsteps. He invested in stocks held by Graham Newman Corporation, Graham's investment company, such as Marshall Wells and Timely Clothes. He also looked up his professor in Who's Who and discovered that Graham was chairman of the Government Employees Insurance Company. Geico, as the company was known, was based in Washington. Buffett felt that anything that Graham was chairman of, he wanted to know about. So he decided to pay a visit. Conveniently enough, Warren's father had been re-elected to Congress in 1950 and was back in Washington by the spring of 1951 during Warren's second term at Columbia. Buffett took the train on a Saturday. Downtown Washington was desolate, but he went straight to Geico's offices. Finding the door locked, he banged until a janitor appeared. Is there anybody here I can talk to besides you, Buffett queried. The janitor said there was a man working on the sixth floor and agreed to take him there. Lorimer Davidson was taken aback to see a youngish student hovering at his desk and stunned when he started peppering Davidson with questions. The two of them talked for four hours. After we talked for 15 minutes, Davidson said, I knew I was talking to an extraordinary man. He asked searching and highly intelligent questions. What was Geico? What was its method of doing business, its outlook, its growth potential? He asked the type of questions that a good security analyst would ask. I was financial vice president. He was trying to find out what I knew. Buffett returned to New York enamored with Geico. With a little research, he discovered that its profit margins were five times that of the average insurer and that its premiums and profits were soaring. Then he went to see insurance experts. Everyone told him that Geico's stock was overpriced. Buffett's reading of the facts was just the opposite, but he found them daunting. They were experts. He was in B-School. Every stock picker worth his salt eventually comes to such a crossroads. It is extremely difficult to commit one's capital in the face of ridicule. And this is why Graham was invaluable. He liked to say, you are neither right nor wrong because the crowd disagrees with you. Picking a stock depended not on the whim of the crowd, but on the facts. Oddly, when Buffett graduated in 1951, both Graham and his father advised him not to go into stocks. Each had the post-depression mentality of fearing a second visitation. Graham pointed out that the Dow had traded below 200 at some point in every year, save for the present one. Why not postpone going to Wall Street until after the next crash, his heroes counseled? And meanwhile, get a safe job with someone like Procter & Gamble. It was awful advice, violating Graham's tenant of not trying to forecast markets. The Dow, in fact, never went under 200 again. I had about 10,000 bucks, Buffett noted later. If I'd taken their advice, I'd probably still have about 10,000 bucks. Anyway, there was no way that Buffett was going to wait. Having racked up the only A-plus that Graham had awarded in 22 years at Columbia, Buffett made what seemed an irresistible offer, to work for Graham Newman for free. But Graham turned him down. These were the days when Jews were locked out of Wall Street's Gentile firms, and Graham preferred to hold his spots for Jews. It's not clear whether Buffett discovered Graham's reason then or a bit later, but when he did, it was a shocker. It was sensitivity training for him, one of his friends would comment. 
it did not occur to Buffett to look anyplace else on Wall Street. That is, to work for someone he didn't know. Once again, he headed home. The Omaha National Bank offered him work, but Buffett turned it down, preferring the familiar confines of Buffett Falk and Company, his father's brokerage. In Omaha, Buffett began to court Susan Thompson, the daughter of a prominent Omaha minister and psychology professor. Her folks were friends of the Buffetts, and her father had managed one of Howard's campaigns. Also, Susie had roomed with Warren's sister Roberta at Northwestern University. Susie had an enormous sparkling smile, round cheeks, and dark hair that fell to a curve at the neck. Bubbly and outgoing, on first impression, she struck many as light-headed and even vacuous. The truth was to the contrary. As a girl, Susie had been sickly. She had suffered from earaches, had frequently had her ears lanced, and had spent long stretches at home with rheumatic fever. William and Dorothy Thompson had tried to make up for it by showering their daughter with attention, tenderness, and physical demonstrativeness. She grew up, she would say, with an awareness of being unconditionally loved, and having overcome illness, she was conscious of a sensation of freedom. She felt not merely healthy, but released from pain. By the time she reached adulthood, Susie seemed to have been put together from all the emotional material that Warren did not have. She took an unusual interest in reaching out to other people, a deep interest. Instinctively empathetic, she had a soothing way of drawing people out, especially at a level of feelings. In particular, Susie had a fascination with death, but it was the mirror image of Warren's obsession. Somewhere in her illness, Susie had lost the fear of dying, and now she was eager to be with people on their deathbeds and to ease their fears of passing on. Whereas Warren thought about dying logically and wanted to keep the whole terrifying subject as far away as possible, Susie related to death in spiritual terms and was eager to wrap her hands around it. Once he started seeing Susie in the summer of 1951, Warren immediately fell in love with her. But Susie was anything but in love with him. She would slip out the back door when Warren came calling. He told her that he would be rich, which did not mean a thing to her. Besides, as Susie recalled, she was madly in love with somebody else. So Warren settled for courting Susie's father. According to Susie, Warren went over to my parents' home every night and played the ukulele. My father had played the mandolin since he was 20, so he was really excited about having someone to play with. So Warren did that every night while I went out with this other person. Eventually, she and Warren began to date. She liked his sense of humor and their Pat and Dick courtship blossomed into romance. They were so infatuated with each other, said Warren's Aunt Katie. Kissing, sitting on each other's laps, it was awful. Hidden behind an illusion veil and a gown of Chantilly lace, Susie married Warren at Dundee Presbyterian on the third Saturday in April, 1952. In 1954, Ben Graham called and said the religious barrier had been dropped and offered Buffett a job. Without bothering to ask his salary, it turned out to be $12,000 a year, Buffett was on the next plane. Graham Newman, a mutual fund, bought stocks according to a few select techniques. Graham's favorite was to hunt for stocks that traded at one-third less than their net working capital. In other words, stocks that were insanely cheap. When Buffett or another associate found such a stock, he would take it to Graham and Graham would decide on the spot whether to buy it. It wasn't a matter of persuading Graham. A stock either met his criteria or it didn't. He did it by the numbers. Buffett's trouble was that he could find more stocks than he could sell. He went through the S&P guide like a buzzsaw. He seemed to be bursting to replicate Graham's entire oeuvre. In fact, Buffett was quicker at everything. Graham would amaze the staff with his ability to scan a page with columns of figures and pick out an error. But Buffett was faster at it. Howard Newman, Jerry Newman's son, who also worked there, said, Warren was brilliant and self-effacing. He was Graham exponential. In 1956, Graham retired to Beverly Hills to teach at the University of California at Los Angeles and pursue a life of financial writing, skiing, and the classics, accompanied by his wife and also by a French mistress. He gave much of his money to charity, and offered that anyone who died with more than $1 million to his name was a fool. 
Since leaving college in 1950, Buffett had boosted his personal capital from $9,800 to $147,000, and now that he had a kitty, he was eager to go home to Omaha yet again. Standing on the train platform surrounded by a sea of New York commuters didn't seem like a life to him. In the spring of 1956, he and Susie, who by now had two children, rented a house on Underwood Avenue. This time, Buffett had no thought of working for anyone else. On May 1st, virtually as he arrived in Omaha, he organized a pool for family and friends. Seven limited partners put up $105,000. Buffett, the general partner, put in 100 Buffett soon had three tiny partnerships, which he ran from his bedroom, and he had begun to envision that his family pool might become something more. In August, he returned to New York for the final stockholders' meeting of Graham Newman Corp. He mentioned to Ed Anderson, another Graham disciple, that he was thinking of setting up a partnership along Graham's model, maybe with a $50,000 minimum. Yet who was to say if he could carry Graham's torch? As the stockholders formally voted Graham Newman out of existence, an investor named Lou Green offered an ironic eulogy. Green, the head of a Manhattan brokerage, averred that Graham had made one big mistake, that of failing to develop talent. Laying it on the line, Green elaborated, Graham Newman can't continue because the only guy they have to run it is this kid named Warren Buffett, and who'd want to ride with him? At a time when his accomplishments were modest, Buffett's awesome self-confidence was the thing that propelled him. In 1957, he was managing a mere $300,000 for just a few relatives and friends. If he was ever to be more than a quiet stock picker in Omaha, Buffett would need capital, and lots of it. And if Buffett was to raise capital, what was there besides that yawning self-assuredness that would induce investors to trust him? By now... Buffett was familiar with virtually every stock and bond in existence. Line for line, he had soaked up the financial pages and the Moody's books. Day after day, he had built up a mental portrait of Wall Street. He could measure each stone against the skyline, and there was no one else whose analysis he trusted better than his own. In the summer of 1957, Buffett got a call from Edwin Davis, a prominent Omaha urologist. They had never met... But one of Davis's patients, a New York investment advisor named Arthur Wiesenberger, had known Buffett in New York. Wiesenberger had heard that Buffett was trying to raise money and had suggested that Davis call him. Though skeptical about investing with a greenhorn, Davis agreed to have a look. On the appointed Sunday, he gathered his family to take the young man's measure. On first impression, Buffett was startling. The doorbell rang and in comes this guy. Egad, he looked like he was 18. His collar was open, his coat was too big for him. Everybody noticed it. He talked so very fast. This was an important moment for Buffett. Dr. Davis could give him capital and, what was more, cachet. If he could sign up the Davises, he would not be investing merely for his parents and Aunt Alice. He would have his foot in the door as a professional. But Buffett did not have the air of someone trying to please. Indeed, some of his pitch was calculated to set the Davises on notice. He warned them that he would disclose nothing about where their money was invested. He would give them a yearly summary of results, nothing more. Also, Buffett would be open for business only one day a year. On December 31st, the Davises could add or withdraw capital. Otherwise, the money would be Buffett's to play with, which he would do, he assured them, according to Graham's principles, and his alone. He presented this evenly, without any edge, but the message was clear. As badly as Buffett wanted the Davises' capital, he didn't want it on any terms but his. Then he offered the terms. The Davises, as limited partners, would get all of the profits that Buffett could earn up to 4%. They would share any remaining profits, 75% to the Davises and 25% to Buffett. Thus, Buffett was not asking the Davises to gamble alone. Buffett's money would be on the same horse. If his results were mediocre or worse, Buffett would get zilch. No salary, no fee, nada. According to Lee Seaman, the doctor's son-in-law, the whole thing was laid right out. We liked that. You knew where you stood with him. After Buffett left, the Davises kicked it around. In objective terms, they had nothing to go by. But the doctor's wife, Dorothy, declared, I like everything about this young man. 
Edwin Davis put up a hundred thousand dollars. By year end, Buffett was running five small partnerships, totaling in the range of five hundred thousand dollars. For the year, Buffett's first, his portfolios gained ten percent, easily topping the Dow Industrials, which suffered an eight percent drop. With Susie expecting a third child and Warren seemingly on his way, the Buffetts bought a sprawling five-bedroom house on Farnham Street. Buffett worked off the master bedroom in a sitting area, which his wife decorated with greenback wallpaper. Peter, their third child, was born that year, but mentally Warren was wrapped up in stocks and bonds. He was working virtually all the time and loving every minute. He said he was thinking of making money before his feet hit the ground. Buffett insisted on not disclosing his stocks because he was afraid that someone would copy him, thus making it more expensive if he wanted to buy more. He wouldn't talk to anyone. He maintained that he was afraid to talk in bed because his wife might hear. But behind the cordon of secrecy, he was living a Graham and Dodder's fantasy, picking up small cheap stock after small cheap stock. His talent lay not in his range, which was narrowly focused on investing, but in his intensity. His entire soul focused on that one splendid outlet, as it had been when he was a boy delivering papers. Company after company, he analyzed and committed to memory, and when one became cheap, he pounced. National American Fire Insurance was as obscure a company as one could find. An Omaha-based insurer, National American was controlled by Howard F. Amundsen, the banking magnate, and his brother Hayden. The stock had been distributed to Nebraska farmers and such in the late 1920s, and then largely forgotten. The Amundsens now were offering to buy it back for fifty dollars a share. Their offer was cheap, but as no public market existed for the stock, shareholders were gradually selling out. After doing some digging in state insurance files, Buffett realized that it was extremely cheap, but he couldn't find any stock to buy. He and his lawyer chum Dan Monan went to the annual meeting. But Hayden Amundsen curtly refused to let them see the stockholders' list. Then, as if asking a friend to spend an afternoon hunting for golf balls, Buffett suggested that Monan drive around the state looking for stock. Sucked in by the Buffett contagion, Monan took off in a red and white Chevrolet for the far corners of Nebraska, waving a hundred dollars a share at anyone he saw in rural courthouses, banks, and the like. It sounds corny, Monan said later, reflecting on his willingness to go. Warren Buffett is as near to Mr. Perfect as anyone I know. Mr. Perfect and his partner captured ten percent of the stock and made more than one hundred thousand dollars. Buffett's first big strike. People who signed up for Buffett's partnership intuitively grasped that Buffett's garbo-like loneliness was part of the appeal. When Buffett insisted on secrecy, it was not merely to prevent leaks, but also to prevent intrusions and to maintain that sweet independence. He wanted no amateur tipsters or second guessers. For a stock to merit investment, Buffett had to persuade himself of it. And if he did, what was the use of other opinions? Temperamentally, he mistrusted advice givers and financial soothsayers. If the basis for a stock was popular opinion, and opinion changed, then what? He was confident that his own analysis would be less fickle. Buffett wanted only one thing from outside: capital. In 1960, now just shy of 30, Buffett approached one of the more devoted of his partners, a folksy cardiologist named William Angle. Doc Angle had built a model train set for Buffett in his attic, and was willing to do just about anything for him. Warren asked if I'd be interested in getting ten doctors together to put up ten thousand dollars each. Angle recalled. So I rounded up a group from Clarkson Hospital at a restaurant. Buffett had yet to appear in public as a money manager. But at the restaurant, the Hilltop House, he made his debut. Silhouetted against a darkening summer sky, he poured out liquid couplets from Benjamin Graham and Shakespeare, interspersed with gentle self-mockery. He was done in less than an hour. At the Clarkson Coffee Shop the next day, the talk was of nothing else. Eleven doctors decided to take a chance on him. In Omaha, at least, Buffett had made a big step forward. The next year, Buffett bet a million dollars, his biggest plunge ever, on a company that, had they known of it, would have made the doctors gasp.
Dempster Mill Manufacturing was an 80-year-old windmill and farm implement maker in Beatrice, Nebraska, 90 miles south of Omaha. The windmill business being not exactly another Xerox, Dempster had suffered from static sales and dismal profitability. Buffett had nibbled at the stock, a cheap, typical gram play, a few years earlier. In 1961, he snapped up the controlling interest, giving him 70% and staking a fifth of his partnership's assets on it. Buffett appointed himself the chairman, a prophetic move and unusual for a money manager, that signaled an ambition to be something more than just an investor. Characteristically, Buffett roped his old friend Dan Monin onto the board, too. Every month, Buffett and the loyal Monin would drive to Beatrice, a dusty town in the plains, like Quixote with his Sancho Panza. But Buffett couldn't get a handle on Dempster. Each month, Buffett would entreat the managers to cut their overhead and trim the inventory, and they would give it lip service and wait for him to go back to Omaha. Promptly, Buffett put the company up for sale. Over the first five years, the Buffett partnerships had left the Dow Jones Industrial Average in the dust. Buffett's partnerships had a cumulative gain of 251%. The Dow's gain, 74.3%. The Dow was up three quarters. Buffett's portfolios, two and a half times. Buffett had an astonishing circle of cronies, who overlapped with his investors. And he did not change gears from one to the other. He was fetching, understated, informal, and a bit of a teacher in either camp. He did not draw the usual line between work and other activities. When he got on the links, he was focused as a cat. Robert Billig, a golf partner, said Buffett could take putting instructions better than anyone. When Billig told him how to aim, Buffett shut out everything else and turned his ethereal concentration on the golf ball. Buffett's passion outside of work was bridge. He had a regular game, the members of which were a sampling of Main Street USA, ad executive, Buick dealer, judge, life insurance agent, mortgage man, railroad attorney, and American Automobile Association chapter president. Buffett would show up with a six-pack of Pepsi-Cola and entertain the guys with a stream of jokes and stories. He didn't talk about the money he was making. The point was, he didn't have to. He played so intensely he could have been working, only with trumps instead of with stocks and bonds. Buffett was enormously dependent on Susie. She paid the bills, took care of the kids, ran their lives. Whatever was outside his range, Susie handled. In particular, Susie shielded Warren from his mother. Even as an adult, he would shake or go mute at the sight of that aging and shriveling tormentor. He did his best to avoid her, and at family gatherings he would withdraw after dinner on the pretext that he needed to nap. Warren's face would light, a touching betrayal of his feeling, when Susie entered the room. She would run her fingers through his hair, fix his tie, sit on his lap, hug him. She sustained him. They were perfectly complimentary. Warren, self-absorbed, Susie reaching out to the world. She tended to an unending stream of confidants and soulless seekers, a friend going through a divorce, a neighbor with a sick relative. It seemed that anyone in Omaha who had a problem landed on Susie's couch. Susie was determined to see that the Buffets did not lead narrow lives. In a trivial example, they joined a gourmet cooking club, a group of couples who dined on Swedish meatballs one month and French crepes the next. Each time, though, Warren would pleasantly ask the hostess to make him a hamburger. He preferred to stick to the familiar, the same city, the same foods, the same single-minded pursuit. The Buffett Partnerships, begun with only a $105,000 grub stake, entered 1962 with $7.2 million in capital, more than Graham Newman at its peak. Of the total, $1 million belonged to Buffett personally. He was still small, but not unproven. And though unknown to the general public, he was no longer obscure. The original nucleus of seven investors had mushroomed to 90, grouped in clusters from California to Vermont. Swelling with new accounts, Buffett decided that he had outgrown his sitting room. He merged the partnerships into one, Buffett Partnerships Limited. He quadrupled the minimum investment to $100,000, and he moved his office to Kiewit Plaza, 
a fourteen-story pale green and white tower on Farnham Street. Buffett spent the day reading annual reports and business publications and talking on the telephone. He often lunched alone, sending out for a cheeseburger and french fries. His tiny staff knew nothing more of his stock picks than his wife did. Buffett did have an advisor away from the office, miles away where it suited him. His letters to his partners were peppered with references to a West Coast philosopher friend, a nom de guerre that only hints at this fellow's influence. Charlie Munger, six years Buffett's senior, had also grown up in Omaha, the son of a lawyer and grandson of a judge. A friendship evolved over the summers when the Buffetts went to California. When Buffett was home, he was constantly sprawled on the floor, cradling the phone and talking to Munger. A familiar refrain at the Buffett's dinner hour, according to little Susie, was, Uh-oh, Dad's talking to Charlie. She recalled, They talked for hours. They anticipated each other. It was like they hardly had to say anything. It was, Yeah, uh-huh, I know what you mean, right? Buffett said he and Munger thought so much alike it was spooky. But unlike so many of Buffett's friends, surely this was part of the attraction. Munger was not in awe of him. And Buffett was so enamored of Munger that he urged him to adopt his own line of work. He kept telling him that practicing law was a waste of his talent, and Munger did not disagree. That spring, Buffett went to Munger with a problem. What to do about Dempster? Munger was no Ben Graham disciple. In his view... Troubled companies, which tended to be the kind that sold at gram-like discounts, were not easily put right. But Munger knew a fellow, name of Harry Bottle, who might be the man for Dempster. Buffett interviewed Bottle in Los Angeles, and Bottle was on the job in Beatrice six days later. He cut costs, closed plants, and slashed the inventory. Writing to his partners at Bottle, Buffett announced, Harry is unquestionably the man of the year. He has accomplished one thing after another that has been labeled as impossible. The redeployment carried a cost. One hundred people were laid off, and Buffett met with new criticism in Beatrice. Bill Otis, a bridge partner, asked Buffett in a kidding vein, How can you sleep at night after firing all those people? To Buffett, who had a thin skin where his reputation was concerned, it was no joke. If we'd kept them, the company would have gone bankrupt, he said. I've kept close tabs and most of them are better off. Though this has the ring of rationalization, Buffett hated being called a liquidator and vowed that he would never lay people off again. But he had no problem with the results. After a year, Dempster was trimmer but more profitable, and it had two million dollars worth of securities to boot. In 1963, Buffett sold it, netting the partnership a 2.3 million profit and nearly tripling its investment. Three things had made it work the initial bargain price, Buffett's patience in holding on, and his and Bottle's turnaround. To Buffett, as ardently in Ben Graham's camp as ever, the first point outweighed the rest. Saul Parso, who owned a men's shop in Kiewit Plaza, knew Warren Buffett as other than a fashion plate. Typically, Buffett would come in and order five suits, all despite Parso's pleading in a dull gray, and leave on a dime. One morning, though, Buffett came into the store seeking a bit of fashion advice, sort of. He wanted Parso's opinion of Bayer Rolnick, a hat manufacturer. Parso explained that President Kennedy's bareheaded look was all the rage. Warren, he said, I wouldn't touch it with a ten-foot pole. Nobody is wearing hats anymore. A bit later, Buffett returned. Sal, what's going on with the suit industry, Buffett asked. Warren, it stinks. Men aren't buying suits. This time, he couldn't talk him out of it. Buffett Partnership bought a small stake in a new Bedford, Massachusetts maker of suit liners, Berkshire Hathaway, at precisely seven sixty a share. In 1962, Berkshire was one more cheap stock of the sort that appealed to Ben Graham disciples. The venerable Yankee manufacturer had long been struggling against lower-cost southern and far eastern competitors. But on its books, at least, Berkshire was a bargain. It had sixteen fifty a share of working capital, two times its share price. As a Graham and daughter, Buffett liked the stock and gradually added to his position. Despite this investment, it was clear that Buffett was becoming more than just a carbon copy of his teacher. He was bolder than Graham, more willing to load up on a stock or to ride a winner. And, of course, his results had been better. 
What was not so apparent was that Buffett was also beginning to think differently. That is, to think in qualitative terms, as well as in the merely numerical terms that had appealed to Graham. When Buffett looked at a stock, he was beginning to see not just a frozen snapshot of assets, but a live, ongoing business with a unique set of dynamics and potential. Concurrent with this growth beyond Graham's teachings, Buffett began to communicate more expansively to his partners in his letters. He used the letters not just to report results, but to talk about his approach and to educate his readers in a general sense about investing. School was in. Increasingly, the voice that emerged was not Ben Graham's, not phrases from the intelligent investor, but Buffett's own. It was by turns articulate, droll, self-deprecating, and rather more literate than one would expect from an investment manager in his thirties. For a young man, he was astonishingly comfortable with himself. Buffett's portfolio was decidedly unconventional. With big bets on American Express, Berkshire Hathaway, and two or three others, the lion's share of the pool was in just five stocks. He ridiculed the fund managers who took the opposite tack, which is to say, most of those working on Wall Street. Diversification had become an article of faith. Fund managers were commonly stuffing their portfolios with hundreds of different stocks. Paraphrasing Billy Rose, Buffett doubted that they could intelligently select so many securities any more than a sheep could get to know a harem of 100 girls. A portfolio with scores of securities would be relatively unaffected if any one stock fell, but similarly unaffected should an issue rise. Indeed, as the number of stocks grew, the portfolio would come to mimic the market averages. That would be a safe and perhaps a reasonable goal for the novice, but in Buffett's view it undermined the very purpose of the professional investor, who presumably was being paid to beat the average. Owning so many stocks was an admission that one could not pick the winners. Beneath his surface modesty he was, in effect, making a very brassy claim, and he continued to live up to it. The partnership portfolio jumped an astonishing 39% in 1963 and 28% in 1964. By then, Buffett was managing $22 million. His personal net worth was close to $4 million, at that time quite a fortune. This spiraling accumulation had no noticeable effect on Buffett's lifestyle. He remained partial to Parso's gray suits, Omaha's stakes, and the University of Nebraska football games. Buffett scarcely thought about spending his wealth on material comforts. That wasn't why he wanted it. The money was a proof, a scorecard for his favorite game. When it came to money, Buffett seemed to have twin personalities. It was nothing to him, and it was everything. He had an overly reverent view of money's proper role, as if spending were a sort of sinfulness. Even when he dieted, he inserted money into the equation. He would write a $10,000 check to his daughter, payable on such and such a date, unless his weight had dropped. Little Susie would try to ply him with ice cream or drag him to McDonald's, but it was useless. Her daddy didn't want the ice cream as much as he wanted to keep the money. Buffett acknowledged his contrasting sentiments quite comically one summer when his family was touring San Simeon, the William Randolph Hearst mansion in California. The guide was giving a blow-by-blow -blow account of how much Hearst had paid for every item, the drapes, carpets, antiques, and so on. Bored to tears, Buffett protested, don't tell us how he spent it. Tell us how he made it. Buffett's money seems to have affected him politically, but not in the manner one would expect. As he became independently wealthy, roughly during the early and middle 60s, he finally asserted his political autonomy from his father. Warren based his evolving politics not on his personal economic interests, as most millionaires and most people do, but on his fears for society writ large. In the turbulent 1960s, several issues awakened him. The Cuban Missile Crisis mortified him, just as Hiroshima had. Buffett read Bertrand Russell, the pacifist philosopher and mathematician, extensively during this period, and adopted much of Russell's internationalist outlook. An agnostic like Russell, and deeply aware of his mortality, Buffett thought it was up to society collectively to protect the planet from dangers such as nuclear war. Unlike his isolationist and anti-government father, Warren recognized a need for government. This was also true on the burning issue of civil rights. 
Omaha had a substantial black population and strict segregation in housing and many jobs. Howard Buffett did not have a public record on civil rights, but as an avid member of the John Birch Society, he presumably did not lose sleep over it. Warren was empathetically on the other side. He quit the Omaha Rotary Club specifically because he objected to its racist and elitist policies. Discrimination collided with his belief in merit and his faith in neutral yardsticks, which lay at the heart of his investing. In the same vein, he thought it was wrong that rich kids got a big head start over everyone else. He and little Susie shared a certain tenderness, but Warren's sons felt emotionally neglected by him. Howie, the second child, was a bit of a troublemaker and was repeatedly frustrated by his dad's lack of outward feeling. I used to misinterpret his tone to mean that he didn't care about me, he said. It's the exact same quality that makes him so good as an investor. There was no emotion in it. Most people, high-powered executives perhaps especially, tend to compartmentalize their lives. They may be tigers at the office and kittens at home, but Buffett was all of a remarkably consistent piece. To young Peter, his father ran on an inner clock whose springs and gears never ceased to turn. Day to day, Buffett was in his own solar system. I remember I gave him a birthday card once, Peter said. He just sort of opened it and closed it, read it that fast. I guess I was waiting for some response. Warren was expressive in his letters, but mute with his son. A bit later, when Peter was in a drugstore with his mother, he saw a book called The Father's Handbook. He said rather flippantly, You should get that for Dad. So she did. When Warren got the book, he called Peter up to his study and said, Hey, what's going on? What do you mean? Peter meant there was nothing that he could tell his dad that his father wanted to know, or such was Peter's impression then. Buffett obviously was concerned, but he couldn't show it. He made efforts to reach out, but they struck Peter as half-hearted. At the start of 1967, Buffett felt compelled to advise his partners that some of the newer mutual funds had better recent returns than his own. Moreover, he warned that his stream of new ideas was down to a trickle. Though he was working night and day to keep them coming, his tone was ominous. If his idea flow should dry up completely, you'll be informed honestly and promptly so that we may all take alternative action. It is noteworthy that Buffett was sending off these dire alarms in direct proportion to the giddiness on Wall Street. To money men, these were the go-go years. There was a frenzy for electronic stocks, each new issue of which was held to be the next Xerox. Had Wall Street suddenly developed an expertise in electronics? To ask the question was to misunderstand the age. Wall Street believed in electronics. Even a toad such as American Music Guild could become a prince by calling itself Space Tone Electronics, Inc. In May 1969, the man from Omaha made up his mind. Weary of Jeremiah's and wary of jeopardizing past profits, Buffett did a remarkable thing. He quit. He stunned his partners with the news that he was liquidating Buffett partnership. And now, at the height of a bull market, he was getting out. I am not attuned to this market environment, he wrote and I don't want to spoil a decent record by trying to play a game I don't understand just so I can go out a hero. The courage that lay behind his decision may be measured by its uniqueness. On Wall Street, people did not fold up and return the money, not at the top, not after their best year. It simply wasn't done. Buffett had plenty of options. He could simply have sold his stocks, put his assets in cash, and waited for opportunities. But every partner was looking to him to perform and he felt an inescapable pressure to lead the league each year. The partnership liquidated all but two of its investments, Berkshire Hathaway and Diversified Retailing. Thus, each partner could take his proportional interests in Berkshire and Diversified in stock or opt to cash out. Buffett would take the stock. He wrote, I think both securities should be very decent long-term holdings, and I am happy to have a substantial portion of my net worth invested in them. He urged his partners to think of Berkshire, which was by far the bigger of the two, as he did, as a business rather than as a stock. But his plans were a trifle obscure. On the one hand, he didn't think much of textiles. On the other, he liked the guy in charge. He allowed that it ought to grow at 10% or so a year, but avoided making a firm prediction. Moreover, though he expected to play a role in setting policy at Berkshire, 
his partner should understand that he was under no obligation should my interests develop elsewhere. Sam Stamen, an investor and bridge champion, figured that Buffett had played out his hand. He sold his Berkshire back to Buffett at $43 a share. But many partners hung on. They could not know what Berkshire Hathaway would become, nor how deeply Buffett was engaged in remaking it. But Buffett had made it plain that he was keeping his Berkshire. As the loyal Doc Angle saw it, that's all anybody had to hear if they had any brains. By the end of 1961, Berkshire was down to seven plants. In the previous three years alone, it had plowed $11 million back into the business, and while its mills were enhanced, its business was not. Its regular plain weave fabrics were commodities, indistinguishable from those of any other manufacturer. When competitors flooded the market, Berkshire was helpless. Thus, in 1962, the year that its modernization was complete, it suffered a crushing $2.2 million loss. On Wall Street, Berkshire's stock was out of favor. Richard M. Tillerson, a security analyst with Value Line, had recommended the shares at the beginning of 1955 at a price of 14 and three quarters. From then on, Tillerson had suffered through years of oversupplied markets and shuttered mills. By early 1963, the stock was at eight and an eighth, down 45 percent from his original call. But hope in the breast of a textile analyst never dies. In March 1963, Tillerson reported that the outlook for Berkshire now appears more promising than it has for a considerable time. In June, he crawled without his shell and predicted a modest quarterly profit. Alas, in September, he was forced to postpone his hopes once more. Berkshire is not now expected to break into the earnings column, as was earlier thought possible, because the rapid movement of many cotton textile producers into blended fabrics has caused temporary price weakness. No profit now on account of temporary weakness, and so it had been for eight long years. According to economic theory, when a company is so mismanaged, sooner or later an investor will decide that he can do no more with its assets and take it over. It happened that Buffett had run across Berkshire at the same time as Richard Tillerson, when he was working for Graham Newman in the 50s. Buffett was merely an observer of the company's troubles until late in 1962, when the stock fell below $8 a share. Since Berkshire had $16.50 per share of working capital, it seemed to be a bargain, and Buffett bought some stock via his partnership. However, he had no thought of a takeover. He approached it as he did any other stock, assuming that he would hold it for a couple of years or so. But with Buffett's interest peaked, Daniel Cowan, a New York broker friend, found several large blocks of stock for him. By 1963, Buffett Partnership was the company's biggest shareholder. For a while, Buffett was able to keep his identity as a shareholder secret, and Cowan, playing the role of Buffett's stalking horse, took a seat on Berkshire's board. Then word leaked out that Cowan's client was Buffett. Stanley Rubin, the Berkshire sales executive who knew Buffett, called to see if he was planning to buy more. Buffett said coyly, I may, or I may not. Still, nobody seemed to realize that Buffett might be up to something. A short time later, Buffett visited the mill. When he found that Jack Stanton, son of Seabury Stanton, who had fruitlessly spent a fortune modernizing the mills, had copies of Berkshire's financials going back to the 1920s, he got very excited and quickly made copies of them. Then he asked to see some of the plants. Jack recalled, I was very busy, so we sent Ken Chase with him. This was the mistake of Jack's life. Ken Chase was already being considered as a candidate to succeed Seabury, though of course neither Seabury nor his son Jack, who coveted the throne for himself, had any idea of it. Chase, an unpretentious late forty-ish chemical engineer who drove a Chevrolet, was also a local boy. He had attended something called the New Bedford Textile School joined Hathaway in 1947 to work on synthetic fibers, and worked his way up to the lofty position of vice president of manufacturing. For two days, the square-jawed Chase took Buffett through the mills. According to Chase, Warren asked questions like crazy about the marketing, the machinery, about what I thought should be done, where I thought the company was going, the technical end of it, what kind of products were we selling, who we were selling to. He wanted to know everything. Chase spoke candidly about the company's problems, and Buffett decided he had found his man. Buffett didn't say much, 
but when the tour was over, he dropped an intriguing clue. I'll be in touch with you, Ken. Meanwhile, Seabury Stanton finally sensed that he was under siege. In 1964, Berkshire made repeated offers to buy back shares, thereby raising the proportion of stock under Stanton's control. Buffett was on the brink of selling out to him, but he thought that Stanton was chiseling him on the price. They were three-eighths of a point apart, or Buffett would have sold, according to Charlie Munger. It was an absolute accident that Berkshire became his vehicle. In early 1965, Ken Chase got a call. Buffett had something to discuss with Chase and wanted Chase to meet him at the Plaza Hotel in New York. It was one of the first fine days of spring. Buffett and Chase walked to the little park in front, and Buffett bought a couple of ice cream bars on sticks. Wasting no time, Buffett said, I'd like to have you become president of Berkshire Hathaway. How do you feel about that? Ken Chase was 48. The man who was proposing to catapult his career was 34. By the time Chase could blurt out his consent, Buffett added that he had enough stock to pull it off at the next director's meeting, and that Chase should keep quiet in the meantime. As regards Berkshire's future, he said, figure out what you'll need. It'll be your baby. Buffett was finished with him in ten minutes. Chase left in a state of shock. Sometime later, Buffett explained to Chase the basic theory of return on investment. He didn't particularly care how much yarn Chase produced or even how much he sold, nor was Buffett interested in the total profit as an isolated number. What counted was the profit as a percentage of the capital invested. This was the yardstick by which Buffett would grade Chase's performance. During the first two years of the Buffett-Chase regime, textile markets boomed. Profits were earned. However, they were not reinvested in textiles. Chase trimmed inventories and fixed assets, which Buffett demanded, and the company's cash position grew. Buffett paid out a meager ten-cent dividend in 1967, but quickly thought better of it. From then on, Buffett hung on to the money, just as he had said he would. To Berkshire shareholders, most of whom lived in New England, there was no outward sign that the big decisions were being made in Omaha. The headquarters remained in New Bedford, and the annual reports were signed by President Ken Chase and Chairman Malcolm Chase, no relation. But a close reader of those reports might have wondered at the hand behind the tiller. The company has been searching for suitable acquisitions within and conceivably without the textile fields, Berkshire announced. Shortly after those words were written, Buffett struck. For some time he had been studying an Omaha insurance firm, National Indemnity Company. The majority owner was Jack Ringwald. A college dropout with a rogue wit, Ringwald had started by providing insurance for taxicabs in the Depression. This led him to conclude that the way to make money was to write policies for risks that other insurers did not want to touch. Ringwald stated his philosophy in simple terms. There is no such thing as a bad risk. There are only bad rates. This was an insight worth its weight in gold. In 1967, Buffett asked if Ringwalt could stop by Kiewit Plaza to discuss a matter that Buffett said would take only 15 minutes. By then, Buffett had learned from Charles Hyder, an Omaha broker, how much it would take to persuade Ringwalt to part with national indemnity. How does it happen that you never sold your company, Buffett asked? Because only crooks and bankrupt people have wanted it. What other reason? I would not want the other stockholders to take less per share than I would receive myself, Ringwald replied. What else? Buffett prodded him. I would not want my employees to worry about losing their jobs. What else? Buffett insisted. I would want it to remain in Omaha. What is your stock worth? Buffett asked, getting to the point. The market value is $33 per share, but the stock is worth 50 I will take it, Buffett said. The total price was $8.6 million. The apparent riddle was why a New Bedford fabric mill would want to acquire an Omaha insurance company. But Buffett did not think of Berkshire as necessarily a textile company, but as a corporation whose capital ought to be deployed in the greenest possible pastures. Whereas textiles, which required reinvestment in plant and equipment, were cash-consuming, insurance was cash-generating. Premiums were collected up front, Claims were paid out only later. In the interim, an insurance company could invest the funds, known in the trade as the float. Traditionally, insurers had managed their float conservatively, keeping far more capital than needed. 
but Buffett thought that float from insurance could be as dynamic as rocket fuel. Float was merely money, and an insurance firm was, in effect, a conduit for investable cash. Buffett's view would soon be a commonplace, but at the time, insurance was a backwater. Many insurance companies didn't even bother to publish their earnings, and few investors were interested in seeing them. Charles Hyder, who brokered the deal, said, Buffett understood float before anyone in the country. Once Buffett had gobbled up national indemnity, Berkshire had a stream of funds for him to play with. In successive years, Berkshire acquired Sun Newspapers of Omaha, a group of weekly papers, and the far bigger Illinois National Bank and Trust in Rockford, Illinois. The Rockford Bank was run by Eugene Abegg, who had taken charge in 1931 when it was virtually worthless and when other banks in town were failing. Most older entrepreneurs, such as Abegg, are eager to retire when they sell out, and the new owners, while praising their storied careers, usually are anxious to show them the door. Buffett was different. Running a bank, a claims office, or a retail chain was out of his arc, and he had no desire to try. Indeed, he felt, if he didn't like the way the business was run, why buy it? He looked for a type, the self-starter with a proven record. What is interesting is that they stuck with him. Abegg, who was 71 when he sold to Buffett, continued to manage under Buffett's ownership, as did Jack Ringwalt at National Indemnity. Abegg would run the bank until he was 80. None of these multimillionaires needed to work, but Buffett understood that most people, regardless of what they say, are looking for appreciation as much as they are for money. He made it clear that he was depending on them, that he underlined this by showing admiration for their work and by trusting them to run their own operations. As Buffett plowed Berkshire's capital into insurance, banking, and publishing, he continued to siphon it out of textiles. In 1968, three years after promising to sell the same goods from the same plants, he closed the smaller of Berkshire Hathaway's mills in Rhode Island, which was irreversibly tied to cotton fabrics and was doomed by the dwindling market for such niceties as petticoats and dress stiffeners. In 1970, with the dissolution of Buffett Partnership, Buffett personally became the owner of 29% of Berkshire's stock. He installed himself as chairman and for the first time composed the letter to shareholders in Berkshire's annual report. Writing to the investors, Buffett used the same yardstick as he had in private with Ken Chase, the return on equity capital, that is, the percentage profit on each dollar invested. Buffett was extremely consistent about such things. He did not have one yardstick in Kiewit Plaza, another in New Bedford, and another for the public. In 1970, Berkshire's profits from textiles were a laughable $45,000. Meanwhile, it earned over $2.1 million from insurance and $2.6 million from banking, both of which, at the start of the year, were working with roughly the same amount of capital as textiles. Of course, the question of whether Buffett, an outsider, would close the mill had hung over him from the start. Malcolm Chase claimed that he knew from day one that Buffett didn't have any intention of putting more money into the brick and mortar of textiles. According to Buffett's capitalist credo, he probably should have closed the mill. But viscerally, he felt an affection for this relic of a factory, whose past seemed oddly more alive than its future. He was willing to tolerate a mediocre return as long as the mill didn't become a drain on cash and require him to put in more capital. Spiritually, though no longer financially, the Hathaway mill embodied the New England work ethic that Buffett revered. So Buffett made a Faustian pact with his conscience, his comfort, and his wallet. Textiles would be bled to the bone, but the looms on Cove Street would continue to hum. Looking over Berkshire's brokerage activity in the depressed market year 1973, one has an impression of Buffett sweeping down the aisles of a giant store, here grabbing National Presto Industries, there Detroit International Bridge, in the other lanes Sperry and Hutchinson. On it went, U.S. truck lines, Munsingware, Handy and Harmon. As the market fell, he raced down the aisles all the faster. J. Walter Thompson, Coldwell Banker, Dean Witter, King's Department Stores, Morse Shoe, Ford Motor, Pick and Save, Mitchum Jones and Templeton, Grand Union, Studebaker Worthington. He would run his finger down the price-earnings column of the stock table, and practically every P.E. was in single digits. 
It was one of those rare times on Wall Street. America was being given away, and nobody wanted it. Buffett's reaction was instinctive. Be greedy when others are fearful. Early in 1973, he wanted to raise money for more investing and hired Solomon Brothers to raise $20 million in senior notes. Dennis Bovin, an investment banker fresh from Harvard, met Buffett in Laguna Beach. They mapped out the deal while sipping Pepsis in view of the Pacific. Buffett's decision to sell notes was based on a Buffett rule of thumb. Get the money when it's cheap. If you wait to borrow until you need a loan, it's likely to be when others are also borrowing, when perforce rates will be higher. He got the money at 8%. Some months later, Solomon's Donald Mutchler sent Buffett a congratulatory note. Just as an aside, the money markets have certainly verified the famed Buffett financial acumen. I'm not sure whether it would be possible at all to do your financing today, and if it were, the rate would be north of 9%. Your timing was perfect. Mutchler did not know the half of it. Buffett had started to nibble on the Washington Post Company. In February, Berkshire bought 18,600 shares at 27. In May, the stock fell to 23. Berkshire, armed with the cheap money from Solomon, bought 40,000 shares more. As the price fell further, Buffett continued buying. In September, he bought a huge block of 87,000 shares at 20 and three quarters. By October 1973, Berkshire, though unknown to the public, was the largest outside investor in the Washington Post, the newspaper that Buffett had once delivered and the dominant media property that he craved. The market collapse of 1973-74 has been oddly ignored in the annals of investing. Yet it was truly apocal, on a par with the 1930s. Early in October 1974, Buffett, for the first time in his life, made a public prediction about the stock market. The occasion was an interview with Forbes, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 560. How do you feel, Forbes asked. Like an oversexed guy in a whorehouse. This is the time to start investing, Buffett said. His doubts about the future had vanished. His stock was at a low, but his sap had never been higher. Berkshire was stuffed with securities, and Buffett was buying them day by day. He commented, I call investing the greatest business in the world because you never have to swing. You stand at the plate, the pitcher throws you General Motors at 47, U.S. Steel at 39, and nobody calls a strike on you. There's no penalty except opportunity lost. All day you wait for the pitch you like, then when the fielders are asleep, you step up and hit it. He had quit in 1969, but now with the market at a low, his spikes were laced and his bat was cocked. There was no equivocation. As he said to Forbes, now is the time to invest and get rich. Buffett was back. When Warren Buffett parachuted into her company, Catherine Graham was midway through the signal transformation of her life. Her father had purchased the Washington Post, the fifth newspaper in a five-paper town, out of bankruptcy in 1933. Kay assumed control in 1963 when her brilliant but ultimately deranged husband put a shotgun to his temple. When she was catapulted to authority... She was shy, self-conscious, and painfully self-abasing. Her male colleagues were condescending, and Graham herself proclaimed in an interview that, given the way the world worked, a man would be better in this job than a woman. She expected to be only an interim caretaker. In fact, responsibility proved a tonic. The Post at the time was an intelligent but parochial newspaper. Graham hired Benjamin Bradley, the Washington bureau chief of Newsweek, to run the paper and Bradley, with significant support from Graham, propelled the Post to the front ranks of American journalism. In 1971, when the Post company was in the midst of an initial public stock offering, Graham overrode her wobbly-kneed advisors and published the Pentagon Papers, the government's secret history of the Vietnam War, despite threats of indictment from the Nixon administration. But the second act of her metamorphosis had barely begun. Despite its clout in political circles, the Post Company was unimpressive as a business. Its flagship newspaper dominated the Washington market, yet its profit margin was an uninspiring 10%. A like condition prevailed at its television stations. In 1971, when the Post had gone public, Graham had begun to shift her attention toward the bottom line, 
but she had left financial matters to her board chairman and advisor, the lawyer Fritz Beebe. As Graham put it, I sort of thought figures were for men. Then, in the spring of 1973, Beebe died. Graham now became the first woman chairman of a Fortune 500 company. She gamely declared to security analysts that she hoped to win a figurative Pulitzer Prize in management. But the world of Wall Street terrified her. As it happened, this was precisely when Buffett began to buy her stock. Buffett suspected that as a 10% shareholder, he might ruffle some feathers. He wrote her a letter in which he recalled his escapades as a post-paper boy and disclaimed any hostile intent. Eventually, he signed his proxy over to Don Graham, letting Kay's son and heir cast Berkshire's votes, an unusual show of faith in management. He also declared in writing that he expected Berkshire to keep its post-stock permanently, a phrase that would have mystified the modern portfolio manager. Buffett became a personal tutor to Graham. When he came to Washington, he would bring a stack of annual reports and take her through them line by line. Some of her colleagues thought that Buffett was manipulating her, but Graham thought he made sense. He didn't tell her what to do. He advised, he counseled. The secret to his seduction was his patience. He seemed to exert a magnetic pull on her, and the more she got to know him, the more she liked his ideas. Buffett's influence was felt in virtually every major decision. It should not be surprising that Graham began to rely on Buffett as more than just a business advisor. As a rich widow, she was mistrustful of potential suitors and somewhat cloistered. Her brittleness kept people at arm's length, as did her stiff Brahmin enunciation. Charlie Peters of the Washington Monthly said, I think Kay desperately needed a friend. She found Buffett unthreatening, and the two became intimate. Graham invited Buffett to her farm in Virginia and to her home on Martha's Vineyard. Buffett countered with invitations to his summer home in Laguna Beach, and Graham began to attend meetings of Buffett's Ben Graham Investors Group. In Washington, which Buffett usually visited without his wife, he squired Graham around town. Kay widened his circle enormously, according to the writer Jeffrey Cowan. Another friend said that the Washington Post really changed his life. It changed whom he was exposed to. Suddenly, Warren Buffett of Omaha was mixing with the likes of Henry Kissinger. Buffett did not like splashy affairs, but he liked meeting bigwigs in the controlled setting of Graham's home. Susie was very relaxed about Warren's having women friends. When someone called her attention to all the time that Warren was spending in Washington, Susie replied, Susie could say such things without blushing, that she wasn't interested in the form of things, but in the purity of your heart. When the Buffets were in Washington, both of them stayed at Graham's. But by the mid-70s, the Buffets' lives had become somewhat disjointed. Buffett sensed that his wife needed a Washington Post in her life. At one point, referring to their nearly grown kids, he said, Susie, you're like somebody who has lost his job after 23 years. Now what are you going to do? Susie's dream was to be a chanteuse. This was no surprise to the family, given her habit of traipsing around in song while Warren was working. Now that she had some free time, she worked out tunes with a local band, the Bob Edson Trio, and performed at some private parties. The prospect of going public unnerved her, but Warren pushed her, telling her that if she chickened out, she'd regret it later. In 1975, Susie overcame her fright and appeared for a run at the Steam Shed, a nightclub on the outskirts of Omaha. When Susie was on stage, Buffett would watch with a beatific expression as if overcome by rapture. He told a friend, when Susie sings, it is so beautiful I can't breathe. Buffett would make similar doe-eyed remarks about their offstage lives. He often commented that he had been unhappy until he had met Susie, or that he wouldn't have turned out well without her. As a couple, they did not fit a normal pattern. Though their interests and increasingly their schedules were separate, Buffett remained extremely attached to her. Even now, she would nestle next to him and take his hand in public as though they were teenagers. Knowing that she was his muse, she seemed incapable of saying no to him. The Buffett's schedules were so divergent that when they celebrated their silver anniversary in April 1977, Stan Lipsy had a cartoonist draw a rye card depicting the two of them whirling past each other on the top of a wedding cake. While they had always had different interests, as the house emptied of children, Susie was more aware of a sense of missing something. 
Kent Bellows, an artist friend who was hanging around the house, thought Warren and Susie had a great marriage. They were a case of opposites attracting. Yet so much of the time, Warren seemed to be in a shell, present physically, but not much more. He would be enveloped in a volume of standard and poors, or preoccupied with his thoughts. In an emotive sense, he was indeed Susie's opposite. Susie said to Bellows, All Warren needs to be happy is a book and a 60-watt bulb. In a rare public interview, when the Omaha World Herald was writing up her stage career, Susie spoke appreciatively of Warren's support for her singing. Yet her description of him, the story was published two days shy of their 25th anniversary, was restrained. Recounting the story of their courtship, she noted that she had been madly in love with somebody else, but had followed her father's advice and discovered that Buffett was just an extraordinary person. In September 1977, Susie did a one-night performance at the Orpheum, an ornate former vaudeville house in Omaha that had been host in the 30s to Al Jolson and Barbara Stanwyck. On this particular evening, facing a hometown crowd, Susie was at her slinky, sensuous, torch singer best. She cooed, Let's feel like we're in love, okay? A short time later, 45-year-old Susie walked out on her husband. That is, she moved out of the Buffett's home on Farnham Street, left Omaha, and rented an apartment in San Francisco. She told her children that she was not separating legally or in other respects from Warren, but day to day she wanted to live on her own. To Buffett, this was an immeasurable blow, stunning, devastating, irreparable. It undid the finely spun cocoon that had sheltered him from whatever was unpleasant or distracting and had given him the comfort to pursue his work. It emptied his home of gaiety and warmth and of Susie's soul-penetrating closeness. There was no one who could remotely take her place. He told his older sister, Susie was the sun and the rain in my garden for twenty-five years. Left to himself, Buffett was mystified about why she had left and miserably lonely. He burst into tears on the telephone with her. Susie soothingly explained her move as an evolutionary adjustment, not a total break. They still could talk on the phone, travel together, even share regular vacations in New York and Laguna Beach. She talked and talked to him. They were still husband and wife, she assured him. But the gist of it was, we both have needs. Among the Buffett's family and friends, who had tended to idealize the Buffett household, there was a sense of shock and also sadness. But Warren and his wife were not in the ordinary sense broken. Though Susie was in California, they talked to each other virtually every day. At Christmas, they reunited with their kids at the beach house in Laguna. In the spring, Warren and Susie took their usual two-week trip to New York. Things got easier, his daughter said, as Buffett came to realize that his life was not so very different. Implicitly, it was the prospect of change that terrified him. He considered moving to Southern California, nearer to much of his family, but couldn't bring himself to do it, partly because it would mean working without his bland but faithful longtime secretary, Gladys Kaiser. In a larger sense, he was loath to change his routine, leave the familiar, or reinvent himself in any way. Susie sheltered Warren more than anyone. She still cared for him, and in her own way she was as good at weaving a web around people as her husband. Susie even suggested to several women in Omaha that they call Warren for a movie, or maybe fix him dinner. One of those women was Astrid Manx, a blonde, soft-spoken 31-year-old waitress at the French Café. Astrid fixed Buffett a couple of homemade soups and began to look in on him. Susie gave them a push. If anyone in Omaha moved in different circles than Buffett did, it was Astrid Manx. Born in Latvia, she had come to Omaha as a girl. She lived in a loft in the Market District, an arty neighborhood in transition from head shops to cappuccino bars. Within a year of Susie's moving out of Buffett's home, Astrid moved into it. Warren's new arrangement baffled everyone. There was talk that Buffett had hired her as a cook, but in fact, they were a couple from the start. Temperamentally, Astrid and Buffett suited each other. They had a kidding, easy way together. While Buffett was looking for bargain stocks, Astrid would stalk the junk stores or scavenge the supermarkets looking for bargains on the millionaire's Pepsi-Cola. When Buffett was in his study, Astrid would be in the garden. She liked being at home, 
and she freed him from having to think about the practical details of living. Remarkably, she also got to be chummy with Warren's wife. When Susie came to Omaha, she and Astrid did lunch, though Susie did not stay at Farnham Street. At an annual meeting of Berkshire Hathaway, the two women sat side by side, making small talk while their common friend presided on stage. This most unlikely trio developed a rhythm. Astrid took care of Buffett day to day. Susie was with him if Buffett was accompanied outside of Omaha. In New York and California, Warren and Susie saw their usual friends. Also, at any formal occasion, such as the biannual meetings of Buffett's Ben Graham Investors Group, Buffett brought his wife. Feeling the pressure of having to support two households, he complained to Charles Hyder, an Omaha broker, Everything I got is tied up in Berkshire. I'd like a few nickels outside. In the late 70s, he bought a few stocks for his own account. He was a bit more of a swinger with his personal money. For instance, in the case of Teledyne, Buffett invested in options, a strategy with a higher chance of either failing or making a killing. According to one associate, he also bought copper futures, an outright speculation. It was almost frightening how easy it was, a Berkshire employee said. He analyzed what he was looking for. All of a sudden, he had money. When a friend suggested that Buffett try his hand in real estate, Buffett grinned, Why should I buy real estate when the stock market is so easy? According to the broker Art Rossell, Warren made $3 million like bingo. Even with his now immense fortune, Buffett continued to live simply, at least in Omaha. He drove his own car, a Lincoln, to the modest suite at Kiewit Plaza, where he and a staff of five ran the corporate affairs of Berkshire. His principal diversions were bridge, reading business books, and watching sports and talk shows. When he and Astrid went out, it was usually to Garatz, an unprepossessing Omaha steakhouse owned by a former grade school classmate of Buffett's. Increasingly, though, Buffett's world, his friends, his companies, his writing, extended beyond Omaha. His 40th birthday party had been on a golf course in Omaha, for his 50th in the summer of 1980, Susie threw a black tie bash at the Metropolitan Club in New York. Susie the torch singer sang an ode to her man. There were tributes from cronies, ending with a poignant toast from Munger. Underneath the party-goer's merriment, there was probably no one in the great wood-paneled room who did not feel that Buffett in some way was to leave a mark. With his scuffed shoes, receding hair, and prominent beak, he looked more the professor than ever. Still slender, he had the unruly eyebrows of a thinker. Indeed, the reveler's affection was fused with an excitement, even a certain idolatry. Whosoever owned stock in Berkshire, now quoted at $375 a share, was getting rich. In 1982, Berkshire hit $750 a share. This gaudy number reflected the gain in Berkshire's stock portfolio, and that in turn was taking wing from developments in Washington. Paul Volcker, the Federal Reserve Chairman, had been squeezing liquidity out of the system. The first effect was a recession, the second an ebbing of inflation. By 1982, Volcker was sufficiently confident to loosen his grip on interest rates. The White House, meanwhile, was a picture of optimism. Where Berkshire once had not had any portfolio, by the end of 1983 it had $1.3 billion worth of marketable stocks and it had all been assembled from the tiny stream of cash that Buffett had diverted from textiles. Berkshire's own stock was something to watch that year. It opened for trading at 775. By spring, it was 15 points shy of 1,000. On September 30th, it was quoted at 1,245. This, as it happened, was 12 points higher than the Dow. When Buffett had taken it over, Berkshire had been quoted at 18. The Dow at 931 had been 50 times higher. Now they were neck and neck. The Dow finished the year in game fashion at 1,259, but by then it was plainly visible in the rearview mirror. Berkshire had risen to $1,310 a share. Buffett suddenly was worth $620 million. According to Forbes, he was one of the richest Americans. By 1984, dramatic changes were afoot on Wall Street. At first Boston, a sleepy firm where four people had worked on mergers and acquisitions a decade earlier, a staff of 110 were cranking out deals by the hour, and the pace was accelerating. In 1975, Wall Street had racked up $12 billion in deals. 
In 1984, 122 billion. Investment bankers, long seen as staid, suddenly were objects of envy and resentment. Young, rich, smugly powerful, and red suspenders, they indulged in battlefield metaphors and terrified Main Street executives. For a century, the street had provided financing at the behest of corporate clients. Now the tables had turned. Wall Street's matchmakers were seizing the initiative. Main Street was merely fodder for their deals. Hostile raids were being backed by a novel form of finance, the junk bond, which had been pioneered by the renegade Drexel Burnham Lambert, and which investors were accepting as payment for whatever inflated sum the raiders offered. Of course, speculation was not new to Wall Street, nor was merger mania, but the architecture of Wall Street had changed. Fortune 500 companies were now overwhelmingly controlled by professional shareholders, such as pension and mutual funds and such investors uniformly took the high bid and ran. Once upon a time, at least at well-performing companies, the major shareholders' commitments to management had been a force inhibiting takeovers. By the mid-80s, such commitments had the half-life of a cup of coffee. Buffett's entry in the grand game can be dated February 26, 1985. In Washington for a couple of days, Buffett got a call from Tom Murphy, his friend and the chairman of Capital Cities. Pal, you're not going to believe this, Murphy began. I've just bought ABC. You've got to come and tell me how I'm going to pay for it. Tall and balding, Murphy was almost irresistibly affable. He had an easy, unpretentious manner and addressed people as Pal. After a stint at Lever Brothers, he had taken an $18,000 a year job with Hudson Valley Broadcasting, managing a bankrupt UHF station in Albany. The humble Hudson Valley which broadcast out of a home for retired nuns, managed to acquire another station and went public in 1957 at 72 cents a share. A few years later, Murphy moved to New York, settling into a cozy brownstone office, and tapped Daniel Burke as his second in command. They operated as a team, with Murphy focusing on strategy and deal-making and the harder-edged Burke on operational details. The company, now known as Capital Cities, gradually acquired an empire in broadcasting, cable, and publishing. Its style, though, was anything but imperial. Murphy and Burke delegated ample authority to their far-flung properties and ran a corporate office that was bone-trim. Cap Cities had no legal department and no public relations staff. Murphy was so frugal that he had once painted only the two sides of his Albany headquarters that faced the road, not the sides facing the Hudson River. His and Burke's blend of vision and cost-attentiveness produced consistently superior profits. Buffett, who had met Murphy in the early 70s, knew that anyone who didn't waste paint on his headquarters was his sort of guy. He had bought 3% of Cap Cities for Berkshire in 1977, but after a run-up in the stock, he sold, a decision Buffett would later attribute to temporary insanity. Meanwhile, Murphy and Burke began to check with Buffett before each big move. One time, when Walter Annenberg was mulling the sale of his publishing empire, which included such gems as TV Guide and the Daily Racing Form, Buffett said, Murph, how about the two of our companies buying it on a 50-50 basis? They went to see Annenberg in Beverly Hills and offered a billion dollars. Annenberg turned them down, and Buffett and his pal went to a Swenson's, just a couple of regular guys with a billion bucks to burn, and drowned their sorrows over milkshakes. But Buffett's dream of becoming Murphy's partner didn't die. He often declared that the Murphy-Burke ensemble was the best in corporate America. When Murphy called about ABC, Buffett began with a word of caution. Think about how it will change your life, he warned. Murphy and Burke instantly understood. Cap Cities, which owned such properties as Women's Wear Daily and the Kansas City Star, was little known outside its industry, and Murphy and Burke led private lives. Now Murphy, a devout Catholic who liked to stop at St. Patrick's Cathedral on his way to work, would be thrust in the company of network executives who rode to work in limousines. Murphy was impressed that Buffett's first thought had been the personal equation, but Murphy wanted to go ahead. Buffett had another concern which neither Murphy nor Burke had anticipated. If Cap Cities bought ABC, then by the perverse jungle code on Wall Street, Cap Cities would itself be in play. What do we do about that, pal? Murphy asked. Buffett said, You better have a 900-pound gorilla, somebody who owns a significant amount of shares who will not sell regardless of price. Obviously, 
that somebody would have to be very rich and totally loyal. How about you being a gorilla, pal? In a later account, Buffett said he had not until that moment envisioned a role for himself. But what other gorilla could he have had in mind? Indeed, Burke's impression was that he had thought it all through. That night, Buffett called Murphy. Having worked out the numbers in advance, Buffett immediately proposed that Berkshire buy three million shares of Cap Cities at 172.50 a share. That was the current market price, up from the original 72 cents. Murphy instantly agreed. Buffett now had a deal to buy 18% of Cap Cities for half a billion dollars. Cap Cities, in turn, would use Berkshire's infusion of equity to finance its planned purchase of ABC. Buffett's price for Cap Cities, 16 times earnings, was steep for a grand disciple. As he admitted to Business Week, Ben is not up there applauding me on this one. Buffett was betting that Murphy and Burke would be able to trim the fat from ABC's stations and boost their profits. And in truth, Buffett was running out of opportunities. Stock prices were rising, and as Berkshire grew, Buffett needed to make big investments. Small ones had become irrelevant. Outside the oil patch, the $3.5 billion ABC deal was the biggest merger ever. This record was not on the books for long. A raft of deals followed, many of them hostile. Investment banks breaking a time-honored code went after former clients. Corporate minnows gobbled up whales. Wall Street had become a war zone. This strange game presented an opening for Buffett. He was hearing from quite a few CEOs that they were under siege. It occurred to Buffett that Berkshire could make an attractive babysitter. It had a reputation as an unmeddlesome and stable owner, and not needing financing, it could move fast. For a desperate CEO, selling to Buffett could be a third route between succumbing to a raider and resorting to self-immolation via green mail. With this in mind, Buffett in his letters regularly touted Berkshire as a safe harbor. For the right business and the right people, we can provide a good home. By the mid-1980s, Berkshire was being driven by the engine of insurance. Its group of property and casualty companies, which was headed by National Indemnity and which had offices in Omaha, New York, and elsewhere, was providing vast sums of dollars for Buffett to reinvest. Those dollars, as he put it, were being traded for promises, cash today as against indeterminate future claims. The calculations involved in such exchanges were second nature to him. Buffett thought of everything in terms of odds, horse races, plane crashes, even nuclear war. Once at a meeting of the Graham Group, with 25 of his confreres, he bet Carol Loomis that at least two people in the room would have the same birthday. She was shocked when Buffett proved right. The simple but surprising explanation was that the mathematical odds of this occurring were 60%. Insurance similarly reduced all experience in life to mathematical probabilities. In 1982, Buffett asked Michael Goldberg, a 36-year-old former McKinsey consultant who had been at Berkshire a couple of years, to run the insurance group. Goldberg was the exception to Buffett's far-flung managers. He worked in the adjacent office at Keywood Plaza. If anyone was suited for this impersonal terrain, it was Goldberg. As Goldberg said, Buffett was looking for people with no ego. Goldberg fit the bill. Berkshire's favorite but not exclusive niche was reinsurance. This, in effect, is a wholesale business. Instead of selling thousands of small policies to homeowners or drivers, the reinsurer sells a few very big policies to other insurance companies, thus assuming a portion of the risks that its customers have underwritten. It is typically a long-tail business, meaning that claims are slow to develop. Thus, a reinsurer can invest the float from premium payments over long periods, only at the end of which will its profit or loss be known. It is hardly surprising that many reinsurers err toward optimism. Buffett put it rather wittily. Initially, the morning mail brings lots of cash and few claims. This state of affairs can produce a blissful, almost euphoric feeling akin to that experienced by an innocent upon receipt of his first credit card. The perennial problem is competition. As Buffett noted, all it took to increase the supply of insurance, unlike that of physical commodities, was the willingness of a provider to sign its name. Therefore, when prices were high, new entrants rushed in. This led to frequent cyclical bouts of price cutting. The first half of the 80s was one such period, with woefully inadequate prices. 
Buffett's response to the slump, though, was unlike anyone else's. While other companies cut prices to hang on to market share, Buffett recognized this as betting against the odds. So he and Goldberg refused to play. From 1980 to 84, they allowed their business to shrink from 185 million in premiums to 134 million. If the business was unprofitable, Buffett didn't want the business. Someday, he wrote this in 1982, losses would force providers to pull back and prices would rise. In the meantime, he would wait. It's natural to wonder why every insurer didn't adopt such an approach. Their shareholders and their management had been schooled on the principle of steady growth. To turn down business would violate the culture. At Berkshire, insurance operatives responded to a very different imperative. Konstantin Iordanu, a division president in New York, said that when he wrote a policy, he was quite conscious that he was playing, as he put it, with Warren's checkbook. This tended to inhibit Iordano from betting against the odds. In 1985, the insurance market did turn. The industry suffered severe losses and insolvencies, and many companies cut back the coverage they offered. The ability to provide insurance, in Buffett's phrase, is an attitudinal concept, not a physical fact. By 1985, both the attitude of insurers and their capital reserves were depressed, and prices soared. Buffett now reaped a double payoff for his prior conservatism. Big commercial customers realized that a promise from a potentially insolvent provider is no promise at all. There was a flight to quality, and Berkshire, which had six times as much capital as the average carrier, had the soundest balance sheet of any insurer in the country. Thus, just as prices became attractive, Berkshire was very much in demand. Berkshire was now in a position to write very big policies, thanks to its capital and to Buffett's attitude. He was perfectly willing to risk losing large amounts of money, even as much as $10 million on a single event, such as a fire or earthquake, as long as the odds, the prices, were favorable. In the 1985 letter, one can hear him gloating, Now the tables are turned. We have the underwriting capability, whereas others do not. In 1986, Berkshire's premium soared to a billion dollars, seven times the level of two years earlier. This translated to $800 million of float, dollars available for reinvestment, and to more than $1 billion the following year. By 1987, Berkshire was stuffed with cash. However, it was far from clear what Buffett would do with it. He would rather buy a good stock than a good jet, he quipped, but he could not find one that was cheap enough. The bull market was in its heyday, in the spring, when Berkshire staged its annual meeting, the Dow was at an eye-opening 2258, and Berkshire at 3450 a share. Buffett had quietly sold every stock in the portfolio, save for the permanent three, Cap Cities, Geico, and Washington Post. But he was stumped for a place to reinvest. Throughout the spring and summer, the stock market rally continued. In July, the Dow hit 2500, in August 2700, there were snickers from the bulls. Those, such as Buffett, who were on the sidelines, were missing the rally of the century. Shares of Berkshire touched a new high, $4,270 a share. It hardly mattered. As in 1969, Buffett was shoveling money into municipal bonds. He had no decent alternative. Then he got a call from John Goodfriend, the chief of Solomon Brothers. During the summer, Buffett had mentioned that he might be interested in buying stock if Solomon's shares got cheaper. Though the stock had dropped by a third, it wasn't at Buffett's level yet. But the business was having trouble, and Solomon's biggest shareholder, Minerals and Resources Corporation, or Minorco, was making restive noises. Minorco, controlled by South Africa's Harry Oppenheimer, had retained Felix Roatan, the investment banker, who had let it be known that Minorco was anxious to sell. Though Minorco was sitting on 14% of his company, Goodfriend had let the matter drift, a fatal habit. Then, in mid-September, he learned that Roatan had found a potential buyer. Goodfriend was stunned to learn the buyer's identity, Ronald Perlman's Revlon. Goodfriend agreed to meet Perlman, who assured him that his intentions were friendly and that he would want Goodfriend to stay. However, Perlman added that he would want two seats on the board and intimated that he might buy up to 25% of the stock. Goodfriend was cool. Menorco would sell to the first bidder that offered it a premium. 
Solomon could not itself afford to buy the stock, and Perlman was ready to pay $38 a share. The market price was in the low 30s, or roughly $700 million. This was early in the week of Monday, September 21st. Rowatton figured that Solomon had until the weekend to find another investor, Goodfriend called Omaha. Buffett arranged to meet Goodfriend and Gerald Rosenfeld, Solomon's chief financial officer, a night or two later in New York at the office of lawyer Marty Lipton, Goodfriend's advisor. Buffett loped in Toot Sewell with a newspaper under his arm in a white and blue seersucker, the lining of which was torn. Seeing his slouched frame, Rosenfeld drew a breath. This was Solomon's savior? Buffett and Goodfriend went off by themselves to feel each other out. After half an hour, Rosenfeld joined them, and Buffett began to ask him about Solomon's prospects, including where he thought the stock would be in five years. While they both agreed that the mid-sixties was a likely number, Buffett thought Solomon too dicey for him to buy the common stock. However, he was willing to invest in a convertible preferred, as long as Berkshire could expect to make an after-tax annual profit of 15%. As they talked, it became clear that Buffett had the terms of such an issue in mind. Convertibles are the half-breeds of Wall Street. They have attributes of a bond, a fixed coupon, and security of principle. They also enable a holder to convert to common stock. They are aptly described as treasury bills with a lottery ticket attached. The holder has a safe investment and a chance to make a killing, though not as big a profit as an ordinary common. Buffett insisted that Berkshire get a 9% coupon and a pair of seats on Solomon's board, one for him, one for Munger. Solomon's senior managers had a heated discussion over the terms, which they thought far too sweet for Buffett. On the other hand, Buffett's capital would enable Solomon to buy out Menorco at a premium and rid it of the threat from Perlman. In the minds of Solomon's executives, the choice between Perlman and Buffett was no choice at all. Goodfriend told his directors that they could either approve the Buffett deal, which would make Berkshire Solomon's biggest shareholder, or find a new CEO. Prophetically, Goodfriend argued that Buffett would be a help to him in running the company. One director, Maurice Greenberg, strenuously objected, but the board went along. The only rationale for this rather expensive deal was the uncertain premise that somehow down the road, Solomon would be better off with Buffett in control than Perlman. It was soon apparent that Buffett had badly misjudged the business. As an important and well-treated customer of Solomon's, he had an overly rosy view of it. Two weeks after the deal, Solomon disclosed that it would lay off 800 employees and fold two departments, moves that would cost it $67 million. There was a sense that Goodfriend was not in control, and this was echoed by a sudden and general nervousness in the stock and bond markets. For five glorious years, the bull market had roared, Though interest rates had risen through most of 1987, depressing intrinsic business values, the stock market had ignored them. By August, stock prices were at the historically unsustainable level of 22 times earnings. No one disputed that prices were high, but the bull market had become an article of faith. Business Week suggested that yesterday's yardsticks were no longer apt. Buffett felt that money managers were not using any yardstick. They had abandoned the effort to value stocks at all. For them, stocks are merely tokens in a game, like the thimble and flat iron in Monopoly. With computerized trading, fund managers were now buying groups of stocks by the bucketful in market baskets. A few million GM, a couple of million AT&T, and a dab of Westinghouse on rye, please. A parallel trend was the emergence of stock index futures in the commodity pits in Chicago. These new futures contracts, which traded next to pork bellies and cattle, enabled speculators to bet on the direction of the entire stock market. To a Graham and Dodd investor, of course, a stock derived its value from the underlying individual business. But the new breed of investor, who was buying the market whole, did not even know which stocks he owned. Security analysis was irrelevant. On Wall Street, if not in Omaha, asset allocation was the rage. Instead of looking for individual issues, the portfolio manager first decided how much to invest in stocks, treating them as a generic class. The total could be and was continually rejiggled, resulting in sudden wholesale shifts. As an offshoot, managers were letting computer models influence and even make their buy-sell decisions. Prophetically, institutional investor warned in September of 87 of the false sense of security from relying on technological masters.
but few paid notice. Portfolio insurance, a high-tech nostrum for fund managers, was said to be a fail-safe. Under this strategy, managers determined in advance to automatically sell increasing amounts of stock index futures whenever markets fell. The theory was that futures could be sold more readily than stocks. By quickly selling futures, portfolio managers would hope to cut their losses before a drop became severe. V. Kent Green, an investment advisor at First Bank System in Minneapolis, noted that when one wanted to sell, some of your stock positions could be very illiquid, meaning that no one would be around to buy them. But Green was sleeping soundly. If the need arose, he could get out by the side door in Chicago. Futures, he noted, are about four times more liquid than stocks at the current time. What escaped Green's attention was that he did not need to sell futures at the current time. He would need to sell when markets tumbled, when presumably everyone else would be selling too. When the hour came, according to a subsequent White House study chaired by investment banker Nicholas F. Brady, 60 to 90 billion dollars of futures were poised on the same delicate trigger as Green's. In retrospect, what was memorable about October was not its suddenness, but the degree to which it had been advertised in advance. Cassandra's abounded. Charles Allman, a newsletter writer, had talked of a huge debacle of the magnitude we saw in 29. The bears knew the prices were high. The bulls knew it too, but everyone wanted the last drink. On about October 12th, Buffett cashed out the stock portfolio of at least one of Berkshire's profit-sharing plans. It cleaned the larder of stocks, save for his permanent three. According to a Buffett associate, it was a clear edict, sell everything. Buffett was not making a forecast. He was merely obeying two cherished rules. Rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Munger said, Warren would never claim that he could call the market. But perhaps Buffett had been glancing a bit more anxiously at the newspaper clipping on his wall, the one from 1929. In the week following, interest rates climbed above 10%. Japanese shares continued to rise, but now no one on Wall Street cared about Japan. On Friday, October 16th, the Dow plunged 108 points. On Monday, October 19th, sell orders jammed the market. Eleven of the 30 stocks in the Dow average could not open during the first hour of trading. In the interim, portfolio insurance sell programs had been triggered automatically. The futures market went into free fall which, of course, touched off a sympathetic drop in stocks. The door was too small to admit everyone through, and the vaunted portfolio insurance failed to save the day. By late afternoon, the panic had become a rout. Buffett's net worth dropped by $342 million. He must have been one of the few investment people in America who did not have a minute-by-minute -minute account of the crash. At one point, Buffett went into Mike Goldberg's office and calmly told him where Berkshire was trading. Then he went back to his desk. Compared with Black Thursday, the great collapse of 29, Black Monday was oddly hollow. No depression or other economic tide followed in its wake. At first it was thought that the crash would prove a socio-economic milestone. Columnists cheered the end of the casino era, and especially of the nouveau riche captains of investment banking. But after a brief pause, Wall Street rolled on. Indeed, in 1988, bankers would cut more deals than ever, and stocks would recoup most of their lost ground. The crash seemed to leave no footprint, save for the jagged slant on the screens of traders. Its meaning was evident only on a small scale. A week before the fall, Berkshire had traded at $4,230 a share. On Friday the 16th, it closed at 3890 In the madness of Monday, it fell to 3170 Berkshire had been worth close to five billion dollars, laboriously built up over 22 years. Nothing in the company had changed, yet in the space of a week, 25 percent of the company's market value had been wiped out. A quarter of the fruits of a generation's work had vanished. Something was wrong. In the fall of 1988, Coca-Cola noticed that somebody was buying its stock. Roberto C. Goizueta, the chairman, and Donald Keogh, the president, were more than mildly curious about who it was. The stock had fallen 25% from its pre-crash high, and the mysterious investor was gulping down shares by the caseload. 
When Keo saw that a broker in the Midwest was doing the buying, he suddenly thought of a former neighbor of his in Omaha. You know, he told Goizueta with a start, it could be Warren Buffett. Goizueta urged Keo to call him. Buffett asked Keo to stay mum until he was required to disclose his stake. In the meantime, he continued to accumulate the stock. By the next spring, Berkshire had acquired over $1 billion worth, or 7% of the Coca-Cola company, at an average price of ten ninety six a share. When the news broke, Buffett passed it off on his cherry coke dependency, quipping that the investment was the ultimate case of putting your money where your mouth is. Otherwise, he was Delphic. A Wall Street analyst termed it a very expensive stock, but in a mere three years, Buffett's stake in Coca-Cola would soar to an astounding three and three quarters of a billion dollars, roughly the value of all of Berkshire when it had begun investing in Coca-Cola. What happened to Coca-Cola in those three years? Income per share rose 64 percent, a heady gain, but hardly enough to justify the near quadrupling of its stock. What did the trick more nearly was a sea change in Wall Street's perception of the business. It suddenly dawned on investors that as popular as Coke was, it had barely scratched the surface in the planet's most populous regions. The average American was guzzling 296 Cokes a year, compared to only 39 drinks for the typical foreigner. And Coca-Cola was rushing to close the gap, aggressively expanding in markets such as Eastern Europe, France, China, and the entire Pacific Rim. It was already earning more in Japan than it was at home. In places such as Indonesia, where the per capita intake was only four Cokes a year, the potential was vast. Keo crowed, When I think of Indonesia, a country on the equator with 180 million people, a median age of 18, and a Muslim ban on alcohol, I feel I know what heaven looks like. By 1991, judging from its stock, Wall Street did too. But what had inspired Buffett to become the biggest single owner of Coca-Cola just before its surge? What had inspired him to invest more, much, much more, in Coca-Cola than in any previous stock? Was it just a lucky dart? Or was it, as Buffett maintained, as close to a sure thing as he had ever seen? Many of his previous investments had hinged on specific events or on values that could be tabulated from a balance sheet. Coca-Cola was different. Buffett couldn't derive its value from the balance sheet. He couldn't compute the value, but he could see it. Buffett's guides to finding a stock could be summarized quickly. Pay no attention to macroeconomic trends or forecasts, or to people's predictions about the future course of stock prices. Focus on long-term business value, on the expected cash flow down the road. Stick to stocks within one's circle of competence. For Buffett, that was often a company with a consumer franchise. But the general rule was true for all. If you didn't understand the business, be it a newspaper or a software firm, you couldn't value the stock. Look for managers who treated the shareholders' capital with owner-like care and thoughtfulness. Study prospects and their competitors in great detail. Look at raw data, not analyst summaries. Trust your own eyes, Buffett said. But one needn't value a business too precisely. A basketball coach doesn't check to see if a prospect is six foot one or six foot two. He looks for seven footers. The vast majority of stocks would not be compelling either way, so ignore them. Merrill Lynch had an opinion on every stock. Buffett did not. But when an investor had conviction about a stock, he or she should also show courage and buy a ton of it. Buffett did that. After the Cap Cities deal, he sat for three long years without buying a single common stock. And then when Coca-Cola fell to attractive levels, he staked a fourth or so of Berkshire's market value on that one stock. After Buffett invested in Coca-Cola, he became one of its directors, but his role on the board was passive. In short, anyone could have bought the stock when he did and gotten the same result. Yet Wall Streeters were dubious that much could be learned from Buffett. They maintained that he got his ideas from a network of tipsters that they, of course, could not hope to crack. As an Omaha broker said with a knowing air, Warren had the best network. This fulfilled the hoariest of Wall Street clichés, that the little guy was no match for the savvy pro. A few of Buffett's negotiated deals, such as Solomon, did arise from personal connections, and Buffett's circle of such contacts was extensive. But most of his investments were market-traded stocks, and, in fact, he instructed his brokers not to distract him with their hot ideas. According to Munger, 
he used his contacts to investigate prospects after he had a lead. Buffett kept insisting that he had no mysterious shortcut, no crystal ball. Most of what Buffett did, such as reading reports and trade journals, the small investor could also do. He felt very deeply that the common wisdom was dead wrong. The little guy could invest in the market, so long as he stuck to his Graham and Dodd knitting. But people, he found, either took to this approach immediately, or they never did. Many had a perverse need to make it complicated. People habitually referred to his mental processes in mechanical terms. Warren's sister Doris reflexively remarked how quickly information appeared on Warren's screen. Mike Goldberg spoke of his iterating insurance policies through his memory. This agile shifting of mental index cards enabled him to recognize past patterns and, through untold repetitions, develop an investing instinct. Alas, the average investor is not endowed with a mental calculator or an online encyclopedia. But this does not imply that Buffett could not be a useful model. Anyone is free to adopt the approach of evaluating a stock as a share of a business rather than a blip on a screen, just as anyone is free to trade options. Munger said that Buffett's style was perfectly learnable, adding, "Don't misunderstand. I don't think that tens of thousands of people can perform as well, but hundreds of thousands can perform quite well, materially better than they otherwise might. There is a duality there." Part of the duality was that people confused simplicity with ease. Buffett's methodology was straightforward and, in that sense, simple. It was not simple in the sense of being easy to execute. Valuing companies such as Coca-Cola took a wisdom forged by years of experience. Even then, there was a highly subjective element. A Berkshire stockholder once complained that there were no more franchises like Coca-Cola left. Munger tartly rebuked him. Why should it be easy to do something that, if done well two or three times, will make your family rich for life? Buffett said it did not require a formal education nor even a high IQ. What mattered was temperament. He would illustrate this with a little game at business schools. Suppose he would tell a class each student could be guaranteed 10% of one of their classmates' future earnings. Whom would they choose? The students would start to scrutinize one another intently. They weren't looking for the smartest necessarily, Buffett would observe, but for someone with the intangibles: energy, discipline, integrity, instinct. What mattered most was confidence in one's own judgment. From which would flow the Kipling-esque cool to keep one's head when all about you are losing theirs. In market terms, if you knew what a stock was worth, what a business was worth, then a falling quote was no cause for alarm. Indeed, before he invested in a stock, Buffett wanted to feel sufficiently comfortable so that if the market were to close for a period of years and leave him with no quoted price at all, he would still be happy owning it. This sounds extraordinary. But one's house is not quoted day by day, and most people don't lose sleep over its value. That is how Buffett looked at Coca-Cola. By the mid '80s, not only was Solomon Brothers' traditional bond business soaring, but it was throwing its weight around in equities. It led the pack in underwritings and was enthroned by Business Week as King of Wall Street. Prophetically, the magazine added, "If for some reason the company stumbles and profits dwindle." Solomon is the kind of place where the long knives could come out in a hurry. CEO John Goodfriend's towering pride suffused the firm. His traders believed that a single moral lapse would be their last. Imbued of old-school ethics, Goodfriend turned away clients that he deemed unsavory and rejected deals that he thought unsound. And yet, eventually, he caved in. Underneath, Goodfriend did not really have control. Departments were virtually unbudgeted. Solomon did not even have a chief financial officer until 1987. When the bond market collapsed that year, Goodfriend discovered too late that he had built a bloated staff. Since going public, the firm had tripled to 6,800 people. Goodfriend had poured capital into equities and investment banking, but had yet to earn a decent return on them. In an eerie foreshadowing, he told the New York Times, "My problem is that I'm too deliberate on people issues." Increasingly. Goodfriend sought his counsel outside the firm. By the late '80s, he was dialing Omaha a couple of times a week. Buffett, his biggest shareholder, was inevitably supportive, and as Goodfriend confessed to institutional investor, he trusted Buffett more than he did his partners. Late in June of 
Goodfriend learned that Solomon was the target of a civil and a criminal probe as the result of Solomon's government bond desk head Paul Moser's series of outrageous bidding violations for U.S. Treasury bonds. As it became clear that Goodfriend had known of the violations and said nothing, Solomon Brothers fell into disarray. Customers began to desert. The Wisconsin Investment Board cut Solomon off. Moody's announced a possible downgrade. Corporate clients told Solomon not to bother calling until they saw a change at the top. On Friday, August 16th, Goodfriend awoke to see his picture atop the New York Times. It occurred to him that he was looking at his obituary. Goodfriend sped to his office. Shortly before 7 Omaha time, he called Buffett at his home, waking him. Goodfriend said he had decided to quit. It was his decision alone, and he wanted Buffett to step in. Buffett hesitated. He had always been careful to avoid such entanglements. In Omaha, he had his life neatly arranged. Once, when Tom Murphy was on the verge of acquiring ABC, Buffett had cautioned, Think about how it will change your life. Undoubtedly, he now had the same thought about himself. You've got to come to New York, good friend insisted. I just read my obituary. Look at the paper. Well, let me think about it. The safe course would be to give Solomon a quiet burial. True, Buffett had a $700 million investment and Solomon preferred, but the preferred stock was far safer than the common. Neither Munger nor Buffett thought they would lose much money in a liquidation. But Buffett stood to lose something nonetheless. His entire career, he had argued for a sort of compact between shareholders and corporations. Goodfriend had failed the trust through weakness and hesitation. But the compact worked both ways. As Solomon's biggest owner, Buffett also had responsibilities. He had a duty which at the extreme resembles fate. By midday, Buffett was aloft racing toward New York. For most of that Friday, trading in Solomon's stock was halted. Its ordinary business stopped. The top executives huddled in the boardroom. Goodfriend came in at noon and said, Warren is the CEO. The executives knew they were days, perhaps a week, from seeing the firm go down the tubes. They were beady-eyed and stale from too many meetings. Donald Howard, the chief financial officer, said, We were in a state of shock. Late in the afternoon, Buffett poked his head into the boardroom and gave a hearty, Hi there. He managed a joke about the little problem we have, as though the firm had lost a valued attendant in the mailroom. Buffett knew none of the details of the scandal, for which he would now be responsible, but he made no attempt to grill anyone. Glancing about the boardroom, he said it was obvious that people were tired and should get some rest. His relaxed manner had a calming effect. For the first time in a week, the executives felt their spirits lift. This is only a temporary setback. He said it as if he knew. After a pause, Buffett faced the troops for the first time. They had seen their firm brought to its knees. They were desperate for leadership, but unsure of where they wanted to be led. Now Buffett told them Solomon Brothers would have to do more than obey the rules. His standard would be far stricter. Anything not only on the line but near the line will be called out. In the morning, Buffett reconvenes with a dozen of Solomon's brass. Eyeing the group, some of whom he has never met, he coolly announces that he intends to pick one of them to manage the company. I'm going to meet with you one at a time, Buffett declares. I'll ask you all the same question. Who should run this firm? Come in any order you like. Then he walks into the adjoining room and shuts the door. All but two of the executives nominate the same man, Derek Maughan, a Britisher who had built Solomon's Tokyo office into a major profit center. Cut to 10 o'clock Sunday morning, outside 7 World Trade Center. The directors push through a phalanx of photographers and head for the boardroom on the 45th floor. But events are moving ahead of them. As they gather around the burled walnut table, the directors learn that the Treasury has just banned Solomon from its auctions. In the boardroom, Goodfriend has resigned, and Buffett has taken control. His sense of humor has left him, but he is running the meeting with his customary calmness and sense of purpose. For varying reasons, each of the directors is convinced that Buffett is the one person who has the combination of reputation, financial clout, experience, and inner strength to save the firm. All of his prior career, particularly his habit of making lonely decisions, now seems but a preparation for this moment. But Buffett is not certain that he wants the job. If Solomon remains on the Treasury's blacklist, Buffett will be little more than Solomon's undertaker. Munger is vehement that Buffett should refuse such an assignment. Around midday, Secretary of the Treasury Nicholas Brady calls. As Buffett ducks out of the boardroom, Munger snarls, You'd be crazy to take it.
Brady is at a summer home in Saratoga, where he's been trying to assess the damage to markets if the biggest firm on Wall Street fails. Buffett takes the call in a side room with antique pottery and lavender walls. He ticks off the changes at Solomon. Moser, fired, good friend, resigned, specific new procedures to prevent a recurrence. In addition, Buffett delivers a personal promise to clean house thoroughly. But if the Treasury cuts Solomon off, Buffett adds, it may not make any sense for him to become its chairman. The call breaks off without resolution. The board meeting lurches on until mid-afternoon, when Buffett is due in the auditorium for a press conference. As he exits the boardroom, he collars Derek Maughan. You're the guy, he says with a nod. Solomon, the colossus of Wall Street traders, is now in the hands of a Midwesterner who once proposed a 100% tax on short-term trading and a one-time British civil servant and career administrator. Introducing himself and Maughan to the press, Buffett explains that he will be an interim unsalaried chairman for as long but only as long as it takes to get Solomon out of trouble. Then he delivers a bit of good news. Brady has just reversed himself and announced that Solomon may bid at Treasury auctions for its own account, though still not for customers. This is a limited but hugely important reprieve. For Solomon, the tough times are only beginning, Monday's Wall Street Journal intoned. One might have asked why they were beginning. The crime had been foiled. The perpetrator was gone. Yet the journal proved sage. In Washington, regulators pledged a full-scale probe. Solomon's debt was downgraded. The firm remained frozen out of commercial paper markets, and more customers cut Solomon off. Individually, these blows were glancing, yet stitched together they wove a familiar thread. To wit, a scandal was in progress. Buffett struck back on several fronts. Early Monday, he distributed his home telephone number to Solomon's top managers, with a letter instructing them to call him at any sign of further misconduct. Though largely symbolic, this was a characteristically simple and powerful stroke. Most CEOs do not like to be called at their homes. The same day he and Munger went to see Richard Breeden, chairman of the SEC, the lead agency investigating Solomon. Breeden, a regulatory hawk, was trying to expand the SEC's jurisdiction into the Treasury market. In keeping with his macho reputation, he warned his visitors that he was prepared to dig up an entire beach looking for a grain of sand. Call us any time someone doesn't give you what you want, Buffett replied evenly. You'll have a new person to deal with in 20 minutes. Breeden was impressed. Returning to New York, Buffett took steps to generate cash. Solomon hiked the interest rate that it charged its traders, inducing them to sell securities. By the end of the first week, a company-wide liquefaction of assets was in process. The biggest worry was the threat of prosecution by the Justice Department. Buffett knew that Solomon wouldn't be able to run its business while fighting an indictment, and he figured that the firm would be nearly as devastated were it to plead guilty to one. Many fiduciaries are forbidden from doing business with felons, and few would choose to do so. That left one hope, play ball with the government so fully that justice might grant a reprieve. Though fearful of hostility, Buffett knew what many are slow to learn, that a sustained demonstration of good faith is apt to be returned in kind if it is not undermined by any conflicting behavior. Now he had to cooperate with Solomon's investigators, bow down before its accusers, actually help justice prove its case. He had to assume very publicly, as only Buffett could, a personal responsibility for the scandal, to show that the stain was not only purged, but deeply and sincerely regretted. As summer wound down, Washington was a buzz over the Solomon scandal, as only Washington can be. Representative Edward J. Markey, a Democrat from Massachusetts, having booked a hearing for two days after Labor Day, had bagged Buffett as the star witness. The Senate had scheduled a hearing for a week later. Buffett freely admitted that Solomon had been in the wrong and persuaded the legislators that he was on their side. After meeting with Buffett, Senator Jake Garn turned to an aide and said, You know, we shouldn't go flying off the handle. A hearing, like a trial, has a carnival spontaneity. Whatever happens, there is no second chance. Even before the doors opened on the sweltering afternoon of September 4th, a crowd had formed in the hallway of the Rayburn House office building. Then reporters, lobbyists, onlookers burst into room 2123. They filled the seats and stood in the aisles, the same hearing room where a glowering Michael Milken had pleaded the fifth. Buffett loped his way to the dais, trailed by a score of photographers and cameramen. He shook hands with Chairman Markey, and there was a click-click-clicking like a swarm of summer cicadas. 
His profile was filled out now, slightly paunchy. His eyebrows danced above his eyeglass frames, and his hair was a mop of pepper and salt. He spoke in a tremulous voice, shadowed by a nervous laugh. Buffett sat in the witness chair facing the members. As he began to speak, his left arm swung in a decisive arc. I would like to start by apologizing for the acts that have brought us here. The nation has a right to expect its rules and laws will be obeyed. At Solomon, certain of these were broken. The baldness of his apology would outlive all that followed. A dozen shutters clicked. Buffett made a pitch for Solomon's 8,000 employees, most of whom were hard-working, able, and honest. He promised new measures to ensure compliance with the law. Speaking of his vision for the new Solomon, Buffett reached for one of those vivid images that seemed to spring from the lectern into America's living rooms. I want employees to ask themselves whether they are willing to have any contemplated act appear on the front page of their local paper the next day, to be read by their spouses, children, and friends. If they follow this test, they need not fear my other message to them. Lose money for the firm, and I will be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm, and I will be ruthless. The hearing, and also the follow-up in the Senate, was remarkably gentle. The most nerve-wracking aspect of Solomon was that Buffett had to contend with so many outside forces. He had to reassure bankers, credit agencies, investors, and the press. He could not control events at Solomon, as he did at Berkshire. It's like waiting for the other shoe to drop on a centipede, he quipped to a friend. For one of the few times, Buffett was having trouble sleeping. The SEC wanted Solomon to turn over the report on the scandal by its law firm, Wachtell Lipton, the most damning evidence in the case. Like any attorney-client communication, the report was immune from subpoena power. Solomon's outside lawyers urged Buffett to refuse. The lawyer said, We're going to have liability. We can't admit to this. It'll be a nightmare. I don't want to hear that stuff, Buffett retorted. He didn't care about the civil liability. The money could be earned back. In his mind, the legalistic details were far less important than that he uphold his promise to the feds. This is our position, Buffett went on. We did wrong. We're going to show how we did wrong. We've signed the charge sheet. Buffett's every move was aimed at winning forbearance. He ordered Solomon to stop trading with Mark Rich, the fugitive oil trader. He ended political gift-giving to avoid the appearance that Solomon was buying favors. He sacked Wachtell Lipton, which was linked to Goodfriend. He repeatedly warned Solomon's traders that they had to operate way, way away from the line, another of Buffett's simple but potent images. Within weeks, a half-dozen of Solomon's traders had gone to Buffett to see if a planned strategy met his definition of the center of the court. Buffett was not a physical presence at Solomon. He occasionally wolfed down a ham sandwich in the executive dining room, where the others dined on veal paillard, but there was none of good friends stalking the aisles. He had close contact with only a handful of employees. Rosenfeld, the whiz kid trader, who was surprised by Buffett's detailed knowledge of arbitrage, and the treasurer, the chief financial officer, the general counsel, and Mon, who relied on Buffett as a corporate encyclopedia. It's a perfect contrast with John Goodfriend, said William Jennings, a senior vice president. Warren is not easy to convince. John had trouble saying no. But Buffett refused to manage Solomon. He admonished Mon. I don't want to disappoint you, but I didn't grow up wanting to run an investment bank. Unlike most CEOs, Buffett did not identify with the other executives. He was less a manager than an investor with a ringside seat, and as an investor, he was profoundly unhappy. In October, Buffett told Mon, You may be a wonderful company, but you're a lousy stock. That was a tip-off. Over the previous five years, the return on Solomon's shares had ranked a miserable 445th among the S&P 500. But now, Buffett's focus was slowly shifting from the scandal to the stock. Viewing Solomon as a long-term owner, Buffett saw a picture that was anything but pretty. Its assets had ballooned, yet its return on capital had vastly diminished. It had consistently profitable areas, but its well-paid investment bankers had been losing money for years. In equities, it was a profit one year, a loss the next. On balance, a huge engine had been assembled, capital employed, labor expended, all for an enterprise that yielded a pittance. Buffett was convinced that the problem was rooted in Solomon's extravagant bonuses. Good friend had let the executives take home nearly three-quarters of the firm's profits, as if he and the executives had still been partners in it. The real partners, the shareholders, had been left out. 
To break this pattern, Buffett decided to act boldly. On October 29th, he took out a remarkable two-page ad in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the Financial Times, reproducing Solomon's third quarter report. The heart of it was a letter from Buffett denouncing the company's pay scale. He emphasized that he had no problem with extraordinary pay for extraordinary performance. But Solomon's share the wealth system was subsidizing all, even the mediocre, at the shareholder's expense. Having said this, Buffett dropped a bomb. He was lopping off $110 million from the pool set aside for bonuses for 1991. As a result, although profits that year earned before the scandal, were double those of 1990, bonuses would be slightly less. Those who didn't like it could walk. Buffett's manifesto generated a groundswell of support from people outside Solomon, many of whom hoped that it might finally bring some reasonableness to Wall Street's pay scales. Inside Solomon, it was a different story. The employees felt they were being made to take the fall for Paul Moser, and they deeply resented Buffett's going public. The day the ad ran, Gary Goldstein, a headhunter, got a torrent of calls from Solomon executives who were indeed quite willing to have their loyalty priced. In January 1992, Buffett faced a crisis. Tom Hanley, the banking analyst previously enthralled by Buffett's team spirit, threatened to defect to First Boston unless his pay was doubled to $2 million. Hanley had used similar ploys to extract raises in the past, including a 40% hike in 1991. Though a prima donna, Hanley was a valued analyst and influential in winning business from banks. Buffett let him go. Four other analysts left the same week. It touched off a panic. The cream was gone. Now rivals were threatening to pick the department clean. At Mon's urging, Buffett backpedaled a bit and guaranteed bonuses for six younger analysts. It was the first time he had blinked. Meanwhile, Buffett and Maughan were trying to design a system that would link bonuses in each group to the group's return on capital. This was not so easy. Solomon had never bothered to calculate how much capital each of its various units was using. To Buffett, it was a fatal oversight. Rather strange, frankly, to me, to think of having a business that employs close to $4 billion of equity capital and not knowing exactly who was using what. It had dawned on Buffett that the government was punishing Solomon by making it wait. He pleaded with the Treasury to bring the case to a head, though he was careful as always not to pressure anyone. Take your shots, he would say. We just don't want to bleed to death while you're making up your mind. The Justice Department and the SEC were demanding that Solomon plead to a felony and pay $400 million in fines. Gary Natalis, Solomon's criminal lawyer, considered that to be shockingly stiff. Kidder Peabody, which Naftalis had defended in the 80s, had paid only $25 million and had not been charged with a crime after Martin Siegel, its star dealmaker, had confessed to pervasive insider trading. All the government had on Solomon was phony bidding. The boyish-looking Naftalis even kidded government lawyers about the case's seeming smallness, remarking, What baby died over this? The assistant U.S. attorney replied, You lied to the government. That's worse than insider trading. The decision was up to Otto C. Obermeyer, the U.S. attorney in Manhattan. As Naftalis and the U.S. attorney's office began to negotiate, Naftalis realized that Buffett had presented him with a subtle weapon. In August, Buffett had promised to cooperate. In the government's view, he had kept his word. If Obermeyer were to prosecute Solomon now, Naftalis argued, Buffett's openness would be seen as naive. In effect, the prosecution would then deter not future crimes, but future cooperation. Buffett had made his own behavior, not Moser's or good friends, the issue in the case. In April, as the case was nearing a climax, Naftalis played his ace. He brought Buffett to the U.S. Attorney's Office, a squat brownish building by the federal courthouse, for a meeting with Obermeyer. As this was to be Buffett's show, the lawyers held their tongues. Buffett began unassumingly, giving Obermeyer a sense of his career. He didn't argue the case. And yet, like a country lawyer who may defend a man accused of murder by pointing out the upstanding nature of his client's family, he was arguing it all the same. In Buffett's experience, Solomon was a proud firm, of which his own twenty-year tie to it was emblematic. Though not belittling the moral and financial depths to which Solomon had fallen at the hour of good friend's desperate call to him, Buffett argued that, in both senses, the firm had recovered. The firm is totally different than it was in August, Buffett insisted. 
Obermeyer asked just one question. How long would Buffett be around? Now, Buffett talked about his philosophy of investing for the long term, of treating his companies like partners, as he had done in his early years and right through the rip-roaring 80s. He hadn't just sucked the blood out. He had stuck with them. And now and in the future, he would be on Solomon's board, invested in the company and watching over it. Obermeyer would insist that the facts were sufficient to indict. Nonetheless, in May, he announced that he would not bring charges. Concurrently, the various federal agencies announced a civil settlement with Solomon, to a man the top officials had been personally won over. The settlement cost Solomon $290 million, including $100 million set aside for private suits, then the second largest penalty ever levied against a U.S. securities firm. The final SEC complaint detailed ten extremely serious bidding violations, Yet the SEC had done more to prove Solomon's integrity than its guilt. Its exhaustive probe had turned up no evidence of affirmative wrongdoing other than that by Moser, the full extent of which Solomon had uncovered and disclosed itself. In June, Buffett stepped down from the chairman's post he had held for nine months. The stock was at 33 and 5 eighths, 25 percent higher than in August 1991. Buffett stunned the street by picking Bob Denham, his tight-lipped lawyer, to succeed him. The bland, soft-spoken Texan was a Wall Street outsider whose loyalty was to Buffett and whose mission would be to preserve Buffett's reforms. Derek Maughan would continue to run the business, but the power behind the throne was unchanged. It would be Buffett himself. Having ridden into Solomon with fanfare, Buffett slipped away with none. In the two years following the scandal, Solomon had record profits. When he stepped down, though proud of having rescued the firm, Buffett was rather eager to have the burden lifted. He was thrilled to get his life back. The Solomon escapade, he wrote, was interesting and worthwhile, but far from fun. Now the sanctuary of Kiwit Plaza beckoned. To his shareholders, Buffett left no doubt. Berkshire is my first love, and one that will never fade. By 1994, Berkshire's stock, which Buffett had begun buying at seven sixty a share, finished at the astonishing figure of $20,400. At that price, Buffett was worth $9.7 billion. Among history's great capitalists, Buffett stands out for his sheer skill at evaluating businesses. What John D. Rockefeller, the oil cartelist, Andrew Carnegie, the philanthropic steel baron, Sam Walton, the humble retailer, and Bill Gates, the software nerd, have in common is that each owes his fortune to a single product or innovation. Buffett made his money as a pure investor, picking diverse businesses and stocks. When he took over Berkshire, the once great mill was fading. He redeployed its capital into insurance, candy, department stores, banking, and media. These were followed by tobacco, soft drinks, razor blades, airlines, and various whole businesses from encyclopedias to shoes. In sum, he built an industrial empire now worth $23 billion entirely from what miserable trickle of cash he could wrest from a dying textile mill, before that mill was sold for scrap. Though still run by a corporate staff of 12, Berkshire, ranked by market value, is now the 24th largest company in the United States, worth more than household names such as American Express, Citicorp, Dow Chemical, Eastman Kodak, General Mills, Sears Roebuck, Texaco, and Xerox. If we have lost the people with Emersonian inner conviction, it is because we have lost the fixed stars that formerly guided them. The modern relativism has reduced us all to being timid specialists, peeping out from cubby holes marked growth and derivative. For similar reasons, the lack of intrinsic value systems, educators waffle and juries seem unable to convict. They retreat, as it were, into ambiguity, complexity, and cacophony. Where one conviction is lacking, a thousand opinions will do. Indeed, they become a necessary recourse. Our captains seem the smaller for it, not only on Wall Street, but in industry, education, government, and public life in general. Buffett, in contrast, seems the larger for his rare independence. As he expressed it, I don't have to work with people I don't like. There are few people, CEOs and statesmen included, who would say the same. We see him in his inner sanctum, without advisors or lackeys, opposite the framed and fading newspapers and the looming picture of his father, 
who counseled him toward just such sweet Emersonian solitude. Hours pass without interruption. The telephone scarcely rings. He is looking not for patterns on a screen, but for the fundamental values, the time-honored merchants, the Ken Chases, the Horatio Algers. He judges them not according to the season, but by the sound principles and aphorisms that his father or his storekeeper grandfather or Ben Graham might have recognized. Buffett has not always lived up to his heroes. He's only human, and he certainly has strayed. But he has at least been able to evoke their memory. When Buffett is called to his reward, it is likely that his bequest will dwarf the legacies of Carnegie, Ford, Rockefeller, and all that have gone before him. The Buffett Foundation will probably find itself with the largest endowment in the country. The Ford Foundation, the biggest, has assets of $7 billion. But the legacy that preoccupies Buffett is not what will happen to his money, but what will happen to Berkshire itself. He harbors a ghoulish fantasy that once he is in the grave, Berkshire will continue to operate as in the past. Indeed, he has taken pains to assure investors that whether he or his wife dies first, in neither case will taxes and bequests require the sale of consequential amounts of stock. If Buffett and Munger are leveled by the same truck, or if Buffett does not get around to grooming a successor, the company, at least temporarily, will be run by a third man, one whom Buffett has already chosen. The identity of this man is a well-kept secret, even to Buffett's children. Beyond that, Berkshire will be in the hands of its board, which Buffett has handpicked. He has recently appointed his wife and son Howie as directors, steps that he hopes will perpetuate the company's sense of mission. His family members will represent the controlling owner, presumably the foundation. All in all, Buffett wrote recently, we're prepared for the truck. His public legacy is secure. He taught a generation how to think about business, and he showed that securities were not just tokens like a monopoly flat iron, and that investing need not be a game of chance. It was also a logical, commonsensical enterprise, like the tangible businesses beneath. He stripped Wall Street of its mystery and rejoined it to Main Street, a mythical or disappearing place, perhaps, but one that is comprehensible to the ordinary American. As opposed to the dark side of Wall Street, to which the public was so accustomed, Buffett's was a face not often seen. He was one of the few capitalists who got fabulously rich without leaving a trail of those he had victimized. In Munger's phrase, he strove to be more than a miserable accumulator, in particular by treating investors and investees as partners. And it is here that Buffett begins to transcend finance and to claim a space on a broader canvas. His comment that his favorite holding period was forever was a stunning breach of the usual horizon both on Wall Street and off it. Forever has an embarrassing ring to postmodern ears. The word seems to belong to dime novels and fairy tales. I certainly have no desire to sell a good controlled business run by people I like and admire merely to obtain a fancy price, he observed. Such a sentiment was unheard of on Wall Street and blasphemous in academia, but rare on Main Street as well. It is more stunning today because it is more rare. It deviates not only from the fickleness of mutual funds, but from all in society that is transient. Today, the frenetic trading at Wall and Broad may be seen as a metaphor for the rapidity with which once firm social connections to job, neighborhood, family, civic affiliations, and the past itself become unglued, and unglued each day all the faster. When Andy Warhol predicted 15 minutes of fame for each of us, he did not get the half of it. In these restless times, it is not only our fame that disappears in a quarter of an hour, but seemingly every relationship that once was enduring or valued for its ongoing character. Professional partnerships splinter apart. Athletic heroes desert their teams. Employers overhire and then overfire. And even our universities, the supposed repositories of our past, race to reinvent the canons that had served for a near millennium. In our daily walks of life, the faces on the trolley change overnight. Investors seek their exit strategies, but they are hardly alone. Viewed in this light, Wall Street's mania for shuffling paper is only the most blatant sign of the general rush to put a price on once lasting commitments. This is why Buffett filled a hollow. More than most, he reclaimed the rewards that spring not from trading commitments one for the next, but from preserving them.